Hey there, everybody. Pete Marto here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of the Monsters Den. We've got in the co 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 captain's chairs Mr. Mike Portnoy, Jamie Laszlo, and Dan Brown. What's happening, fellas? Ooh. You guys ready to talk some David Lynch? Good to be back to see all these guys. Back. Lynch. We're going to rank David Lynch. So tonight uh, we have we have for the last couple of weeks we have all been rewatching and going through these David Lynch classics. And the task at hand is to rank our top five. So for some a little bit easier, for some of us a little bit harder. I found this kind of difficult because as I was telling the guys before we went on the air, I really, really like seven of these films a lot. And trying to just pick the five of the seven was a little tough for me, but I think I finally did it. So uh, we're going to have Mike go first, followed by Jamie, followed by Dan, followed by myself. We'll start at number five and work our way back to number one. So Mike, kick us off. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Good to be back. David Lynch is one of my biggest heroes of all time. My number two film director of all time, only behind Stanley Kubrick, which, you know, he's like, to me, the Beatles of music. So uh, David Lynch are kind of like, David Lynch is like the Pink Floyd of music for me. <laughs> you know, the, always number two, but man, that's still a pretty high position for me. I love him. Um, to me, ranking these was actually very easy. To be honest, my top four is easy. They've been cemented this way for a long time. Uh, the number five position, the number five and six I struggled with, and then the bottom ones were easy for me. So it wasn't much of a struggle for me. Um, the biggest struggle for me was deciding what T-shirt to wear. Uh, because, you know, your T-shirt game on, on shows like this is very important. And I have a plethora, if I may use such a word, a plethora of David Lynch affiliated shirts. So wow. I brought a whole stack of them. So I'm going to do wardrobe changes throughout the episode. There you go. Uh, All I right, just, I decided, I, I decided to start with a good old generic portrait of, of, uh, of the man with the tall gray hair and uh, coming in at number five. And like I said, uh, I struggled with this position between two films. Um, so the one that I bumped to the number six position, I guess we'll talk about if we talk about honorable mentions at the end, it just, just eked out the, the top five. So I ultimately went with Wild at Heart in my number five position, uh, 1990. Uh, he made this and the original Twin Peaks around the same time. And I was in full blown David Lynch mode uh, when Twin Peaks, the original Twin Peaks came out in 1990. Uh, so when this came out in the theaters, I remember going to see it opening night in the theaters. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's probably the most Twin Peaks-esque of all of his feature films, other than Fire Walk With Me, obviously, because it's, it's a lot of very bizarre, strange characters. I mean, he always has bizarre, strange characters, but uh, sometimes the storylines are just so abstract, and we'll talk a lot about that, but so many of his films have this really abstract, non-linear you know, form, whereas Wild at Heart is... There is a story there. It's it's kind of a structured story. It's a road story. It's a love story, but it just has these bizarre, bizarre characters. And so many of the actors from Twin Peaks uh, make cameos in this. Cheryl Lee, who, who plays Laura Palmer in Twin Peaks, and uh, Cheryl and Fenn is in this. And then, of course, you have all the regulars, Jack Nance and um, uh, 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 Crispin Glover is a great, great uh, uh uh, kind of new role that, uh, for a perfect player for to do bizarre character in the Lynch film, but also Harry Dean Stanton, Isabella Rossellini, Laura Dern. So they're all the, the Lynch regulars. And then of course, Nicolas Cage, either you love him or you hate him. I, I generally tend to hate him with the exception of this Mandy and leaving Las Vegas. I think he's brilliant in all three of those. Vampire's but, uh, Kiss. You don't like Vampire's Kiss. Yeah, that's good too, but it's like purposely be, you know, but, uh, this, I mean, the, the irony of this is his whole persona in this is based on Elvis Presley. And he goes around, you know, he does the whole Love Me Tender song at the end. And he's, he's all very Elvis in this whole thing. And the biggest irony is, of course, years later, he married Lisa Marie Presley. So Elvis become, became his father-in-law, you know, which is the, cra the greatest twist of them all. I never thought of that. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, I, I, you know, I love its quirkiness. Oh, Willem Dafoe's character in this, uh, that scene where he's where he's seducing Lord Dern. Oh, my God, that is up there with one of the greatest Lynch villain Lynch villains. And Lynch has a lot of villains. We'll, we'll get into all of them with each one of these films. But Willem Dafoe's character in this is uh, 
that one scene with the seduction is just so great, so classic. And uh, I just loved it because it was it was filled with sex and violence and drugs and heavy metal. And it came yeah. out around the same time as Twin Peaks when I was like in full Twin Peaks mania. So that's my number five, Wild at Heart. Ooh. Very good. All right. Cool. All right, Jamie. Oh, me, number five. <clears throat> I'm going to go with Eraserhead. I don't know if you guys are going to have it a little higher or not, but uh, the plot, does it even matter what the plot is? It's basically John Nance playing uh, Henry Spencer, lives in an industrial type area with his angry girlfriend and they have an alien baby. There's your plot. But uh, this is the quintessential cult movie, I think. I think this thing was a cult movie on opening night, 10 seconds into the opening credits. Yeah. That fast. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's hard to watch because, not just because of the images, but because of the sounds. Oh, There's yeah, like yeah. sounds of uh, steam escaping and machinery working, and it's constant. I was watching this uh, in the uh, spare bedroom a couple weekends ago for this show. And my wife got home from work and came into the bedroom and said, what is that noise? Is that you or is that the neighbors? <laughs> I said, it's Eraserhead. <laughs> so um, yeah, and it's, uh, you know, David Lynch is a painter, right? And I, did you ever watch his documentary? Where he's he started talking as an artist. It, goes, it has nothing to do with his movies. It's his childhood up to Eraserhead mm -hmm. and then it's over. But he said in the late sixties, he was painting and he painted um, like green leaves against a black background. And he sat back with a smoke and he could see it moving. It could, he could hear the wind. And he thought, a moving painting, huh? So that's basically what his movies kind of are, a moving, moving painting. But this, I would say, is a moving pencil sketch with harsher lines, thinner lines, jagged lines. But, um, and he, he lived on location. They filmed this over five years. There's scenes where uh, John Nance is walking down a hallway, opens up a door, and when he walks into the room, that scene when he walks into the room is a year later. And they said he had to, they had to hide him when they drove around because he was too shocking with the hair for people. <laughs> and in that time, you know, people would like look and go, what are they up to? But uh, what else? Um, I, I wonder though, is it hard or easier for an actor to act in a movie like this, to act bizarre and unnatural? Because, you know, they, they look at each other longer. They stare at each other. They have long pauses between sentences. And you see how I'm smiling right now as I talk? If I was in a David Lynch movie, I might talk like this. And then oh, smoke no. after the sentence. <laughs> the scene, very uh, natural. The scene at the dinner table with the chickens and everything, and the yeah, father, when he's just the father is just staring in the camera, smiling, and it, it almost looks like a painting, like it's frozen. Yes. And then the daughter walks in behind. It's just, yes. everybody to be in a David Lynch film, you have to be like it's as if you're in a an acid trip or a nightmare or something. Yeah. That's what the, the tone of all of his films. Yes. I wonder how he sets that tone as he's directing on the set, you know? No, don't do that. Be crazier. But um, we got to talk about the girl in the radiator. Because you can go to uh, a cheap horror movie. There you go. In heaven, everything <laughs> yeah. is fine. T-shirt <laughs> number two. Okay. Yeah, I won't wear this. I'll just show it off right now. But yeah. Oh, yeah. Everybody in heaven, everything is fine. Yeah. The diseased chipmunk chick cheeks. Yeah. That, that I remember the first time I saw her, I saw this movie, God, in college. And, uh, you know, you can go to a, a movie nowadays, a horror movie, and they might have a hundred jump scares in there. Ah, ah. But five minutes after you leave the theater, you forgot all those jump scares and what happened. But if you get an eerie image like that girl, that stays with you forever. That's the thing nightmares are made of. Yeah. And, and when the aliens are falling and she's stepping on them, giggling, holy cow, I'm getting shivers right now. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, my number five. I respect it. Like I respect the good nightmare I have at night, but it's hard to watch. Yeah. Not if you, not if you smoke a little pot first, that helps. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Recommend. I get random tested at work. 
<laughs> All right, Dan, you're number five. Well, you know, I have to, first I, I'd like to weigh in. Well, I won't tell me number five. I want to weigh in on Wild at Heart. And when Mike had made the point about he liked the film Mandy and so forth and so on, his performance in Wild at Heart has kind of, that's kind of like this training ground of who he's become as of late is over the top crazy. And he plays that in Wild at Heart. Wild at Heart is not on my list. Uh, only reason I have it is I find that it is, whereas Blue Velvet uh, has a lot of violence and there's, well, sex, um, Wild at Heart, there's like, it's like Blue Velvet on steroids. It's on a road trip. And there are really no nice people mm -hmm. in it. Uh, and the other thing about Wild, I just want to talk about Wild at Heart just a little bit before I go on my film, because Wild at Heart, it's interesting because Mike, you just did a show about Quentin Tarantino. And uh, Quentin Tarantino has been kind of critical of uh, David Lynch. And it's ironic that the plot of Wild at Heart is very similar to True Romance with the high, the, the Elvis worship and the high sexuality and this and that. I just want to bring that up. Yeah, I absolutely. like to bring up, you know, silly points about this. But my number five is, in fact, Eraserhead. Um, and why I say Eraserhead is like a story has to begin in the beginning. And that's his career. And as Jamie had said earlier, yes, it was four or five years to make this film. Uh, he went out west and he got a uh, kind of like a, he was accepted uh, to the AFI Institute, the American Film Institute. It was a, it was a mansion that was in Beverly Hills. I can't remember who's owned by, but it was a kind of an, a, an advanced filmmaking class. And while he was there, he had the idea of the racer head. And I cannot remember the man who ran this program, uh, but he had the blessings of the guy that was at this program, AFI. I think it was Sissy Spacek, no? I, I, maybe you're getting no, to Sissy that. Sp Jack Fisk, her husband, was in, uh, was okay. in Racerhead. And Sissy Spacek used to do and do the clapboard or do something during the day, but he was an actor. But anyhow, this was a, a film professor. And the board members, when he went there to make this film, when he was the AFI, which is kind of like kind of backing him a little bit, at least psychologically backing him. Um, the board members said, this is not the films we make. And the director of this institute, I wish I remembered his name. I didn't write it down. Uh, he said, no, these are the films that we should be making here experimental because he brought the idea of a racer head to him and eventually over the years they found out that this director resigned because of that because the because the board of directors did not believe in creating film creating a visual experience with film but none of us being said a racer head i saw a racer head originally in the late 70s in where it should be uh, in a midnight showing and I went there and yes, in the spirit of the late seventies, yes, I did not go in there stone sober at 12.05 AM or whatever it was. And it was kind of like, holy shit, you're watching this thing. So when I turned around and I decided to review it after many years and I bought the Criterion uh, based on Peter's uh, recommendation, get the Criterion, with all the supplemental material and so forth, I had to sit and watch it at three in the morning in my house. I could not sit there and watch it before breakfast. Watch it middle of the night to capture that same persona. And it is an amazing film, visually. And it sets this, the tone of what David Lynch was with sounds, the creepiness. He's all about deformed people. As a matter of fact, there's outtakes of Jack Nance where he, he shot sequences. David Lynch is obsessed with dead animals. And uh, he had film footage of Jack Nance staring at a dead cat in this film. So it is the creation of his career and what he did and became what a David Lynch, and as I wrote a list of some things about his films, that are certain Lynchisms about his films that are his, uh, like Hitchcock appearing in cameos or somebody, John Landis doing what, See You Next Tuesday in all of his movies. There's always some thing. David Lynch has these things. Racerhead is an amazing piece of cinema and it just sits there. And the funny, I'll close it by saying, when they were doing all the umbilical cord things, um, the actress who was at that time, Jack Nance's wife, 
who eventually became the log lady in Twin Peaks. They used to go to the hospital showing how much of a simpler time it was and ask if they had any discarded umbilical cords. And they would give them a sack of them. And they'd go back to the movie set and use these umbilical cords on the film. It, God forbid, that would never happen today. But it was the whole, you know, the whole creative spirit with David Lynch. This set his career off. And as weird as it is, I would not show this to say, hey, here's a kid's party. Let's watch a racer head. Oh, no. you know? <laughs> but, and meanwhile, the funny story about that, while Jack Nance, he, 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 de he developed this bonding with Jack Nance. And Jack Nance became his muse in a weird sort of way. And there was at one point in time that they had to finance, help pay for their bills while they were living. And him and Jack Nance used to deliver loose newspapers while, while they were making this film. But just the whole spirit of taking this, they lived in this, uh, what, garage area, and they just created this film over four years. That is passion that you don't see. That's a passion you'll never see again. And that's why this is number, it's number, not number one, but it's, it's planting the seeds of his career. And from there, boom, he went to the stars. So, And he never gave away the secret on how he made the alien baby. And he made everyone sign documents and never give away the secret. There were rumors that it was a calf fetus, but, and apparently he buried it, but no, he never. He not never true. Gave, I have them right here. You have, you, you know, why? <laughs> hey, hey, Mike, are you trying, are you trying to upend Jamie on his props? You have t Put it open. You have, you if it was me, I'd be cutting that thing open with blood hearts. <laughs> You know, I just, you know, it's so funny. I was going to sit there and go like, you know, not, not to demean myself. I was going to get a, I was going to get a tank of helium, like Frank Booth, ingest it and go like, don't you fucking look at me. Like a, like a, like a, like a munchkin. <laughs> you know, but I sat there and said, no, 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 no. I'm the, I'm the adult of the group. Not well, I'm, adult. I'm not really an adult. Fuck, okay. I'm already wondering the things Jamie can do. And, and one of them could be suck on some nitrous, but we'll see. We'll see what he's got up his sleeves. Let me tell you, something. after the pouring the blood on his head, nothing but these guns. I, <laughs> when he sat there from the moment, when he sat there in the Albert Hitchcock show, and he was going to walk out there with his punch, and he did, did the silhouette with a baseball cap on our Hitchcock show, and did the opening of the Hitchcock TV show, I sat there and said, this is a man I do not want to fuck with in the marketing department. <laughs> there you go. So anyhow, Eraserhead is my number five. And yes, thank you so much. Let's move on. All right, my number five. Uh, and kind of like Mike too. I, you know, I had my one through four, I think I was pretty set on. Uh, I had three other films that were like jockeying for number five. And I, I ultimately feel really bad that I left two for honorable mentions, but uh, I decided to go with the one that I watched the, the last, the last most recent one that I caught, because uh, I've gone through all these films in recent weeks, and that's 1997's Lost Highway, right. which is probably one of his weirder films. Well, they're all pretty Sounds weird, right. but, um, and I just, uh, again, so many of these lynchisms that we're talking about running rampant through this film. It's like, it's like, you know, they start you off with this storyline. You've got this jazz musician and his wife and all of a sudden all these weird things start happening. And then all of a sudden there's a murder or was there. And then we see different characters. But wait, we see Patricia Arquette again playing a different character. Where's Bill Pullman? I don't know. Who's this young guy? How does he figure into all this? And now she's involved with him. Or is she? And you're left wondering like, is this a dream? Is this really happening? Is this an alternate reality? Is the end of the film gonna come back and all of a sudden bring everything back together? I'm not gonna tell you now because you gotta go watch it. But uh, I think this is a really creepy and weird film that borders on kind of like psychological horror. Part of it's like a, a you know typical crime thriller mystery. Great performances here. I think Patricia Arquette is amazing in this movie. She's never looked better. And I think she does a really great job of playing these two characters. Are they two really? We don't really know. It's hard to say. Uh, kind of a weird, ambiguous ending, I think. There's a good amount of violence. There's plenty of sex and uh, a very dark film. Uh, again, this is another one of those movies that like, does it take place in LA? 
because I know the Lynch, a couple of Lynch's films seem to be kind of like LA driven for the most part. Uh, but I always like the real kind of stark yet dreamy yet kind of unsettling nature of this film. And I think the acting by everybody involved here, and it's got a lot, you know, and have a Robert Blake in this movie, just off the wall, creepy character he plays. You, you almost don't even know it's him. Uh, but then, you, you know, and he got a lot of attention when this film came out. This film did not do very well, by the way. Um, but, and you've got, you know, Robert Loggia who plays like the, the gangster guy, cause there's gotta be this crazy gangster dude in all of these films, right? Uh, really, really well done. Gary Busey's in this as well. Great cast, off the wall film. If I was to like give someone a recommendation to watch a David Lynch film who's never seen any of his films, I would not tell him to watch this one first. However, I really enjoy this a lot. And I think I even enjoyed it more when I watched it again recently because a good chunk of these films I hadn't seen in a while. I've seen them all. Uh, but it's always good to kind of revisit before you do a show like this. And it's really cool when you haven't seen a film in like five, 10 years and you rewatch it, you're like, wow, I like that better than I did, you know, yeah. 15 years ago or whatever. So yeah, number five is Lost mm -hmm. Country. As a matter of fact, may I interject? Robert Loja got the part in Lost Highway because he was apparently originally uh, offered, while well, he was brought in for a casting session for Frank Booth in Blue Velvet. And like David Lynch had him waiting for like five, they had already cast Dennis Hopper. And Robert Loja sat there for a couple of hours and he felt guilty. <laughs> so when Lost Highway came up, he offered him the part of was it Eddie or was it Eddie the gangster? What was his name? The gangster role. Yeah, was it Eddie? Eddie? No, I don't remember the name. Was yeah. it Eddie? But he offered he offered him to get role of the gangster role because he felt he was obligated to give Robert Loge a role. And Robert Loge is great. He's great about yeah. it. And I think actually he, he thought about him with a road rage episode where the guy's going he's going nuts on the guy. But that's how Robert Loge got the role because David Lynch felt bad that he didn't, that he already had cast Dennis Hopper and Robert Loja came in, he's like, oh God, it's already cast, what do I do? Good choice, he's perfect for the role. Oh, hey, so worked. far it all worked out. Yep. You know, I watched it recently too and I liked it better. And that in Mulholland Drive, I liked better than the first time I saw when they first came out. Yeah. I think sometimes a David Lynch movie needs to sit on a shelf for just a few decades, almost. <laughs> and, then, and then everything is a little dated. The music is a little dated, the hairstyles, the fashion, and then it becomes more unworldly that way instead of, oh, David Lynch is just trying to be weird now. Mm -hmm. I also think, too, that there's so many hidden facets of his films that you don't get the first time. You maybe don't get the loves, second time. Okay. And it may take the third time before it's like, oh, that's where he was going with this. At least that's what you think, right? Because he's notorious for not like saying, uh, well, this is what this was meant to be in this film. It's like, in other words, he wants the viewer to figure it out for themselves. He's not going to tell you. It's like, it's up for interpretation on the viewer. So, and that, throws, I think that's pretty cool. He, he throws out hints. Yeah. He throws out little things about his films, but he never explains. And that's a great filmmaker. Yeah. He wants you to watch his film and observe it. Yeah. Now, you may not, what you, the conclusion you come up with may not be what he thought, but he wants, he wants to stimulate thought. That's his thing with his films. No, and that's one of his, that's one of the beauties of his films, as crazy and offbeat as they are, you know. Yeah. His movies are like prog rock albums. There's always more under the surface than you first realize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. With that being said, yeah. back, back to I knew, Mike. I knew he had to throw in a prog rock. <laughs> that's my gateway to Mike. <laughs> yeah, he was just setting up the transition. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a minute to talk about uh, um, Lost Highway as well, because it's not in my top five. So being we're talking about it. Uh, yeah, it was his first film where he did, he really did this crazy nonlinear thing where the storyline takes an extreme shift halfway through the film. And he ended up continuing with that kind of uh, writing with his next two films, both Mulholland Drive and, and uh, Inland, Inland Empire are similar as well. So this was like the first of the three kind of really strange nonlinear writing. Um, and the cast was great. Robert Blake's character is so scary. That scene at the party, uh, you know, it's the first time you see the mystery man. And, oh, it's really, really eerie. And um, some of the, 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 
the crazy cameos uh, like Marilyn Manson and Henry Rollins, yep. you know, strange cameos from people that you wouldn't expect. But uh, also it was creepy, the whole idea of somebody filming you while you're sleeping and sending the tapes. And so I found all that really, really uh, interesting, but it didn't crack my top five. Uh, my good, good I guess, soundtrack too. Oh, that's it. That's, 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 that's loud it. music. This is interesting because I this, I didn't track his top five. Wow, that's wild. I'm trying. I'm just. I'm. I'm curious to know what's going on in Mike's mind right now in his top. Well, five. I'm going to change my. I'm going to do a wardrobe change for my number four. Is it Isabella Rossellini T-shirt? Oh no, I like your topless with the tats. Let's keep this. Come on, buddy. Let's go. My number four <laughs> is. <laughs> Dun, dun, dun. Come on, put a couple of nipple rings in. We're off to Branson. Eraser head. <laughs> there we go. All right, there you go. All right. I couldn't hear a word you were saying, so I took my headphones off. But it's okay. We were doing play by play. Insulting. It was insulting in a very friendly way. It's okay. My number and four. Flirting with you. So it's already been mentioned <laughs> on two other you. lists. This is uh, this is where it all began, and uh, to show off my baby X back here. <laughs> yeah, it's the I, best. I love it. This was, um, I mean, if David Lynch had only made this film and then never made another film, he would still be a legend. I mean, this was so incredibly groundbreaking. And as you know, we've already discussed it a bit, but he spent so many years making this, uh, financed it himself and him. Uh, he pretty much did everything. He wrote it, directed. The sound design on this is just incredible. I mean, the, the sound design within itself is, is a masterwork. Uh, he edited it himself. The only thing he didn't do was shoot it. Frederick Elms shot it, who stayed with him for many, many, many years. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, like we already said, it's it's um, like like a nightmare come to, to life. Uh, I saw it as a midnight film as well for the first time. Uh, I think at the mini cinema in Uniondale, uh, Long Island, when I was uh, a teenager and I was... Uh, you know, I smoked a little pot before watching it and it just blew my mind. And then uh, a few years later, uh, when it finally came, I finally got a hold of it on VHS and DVD. I mean, I, it ended up being a staple in my my house where friends would come over and we would just get high and watch it and and just trip out on it. It, it is something that you could watch it just visually, you know, I mean, and the sound and vision, there's not much dialogue and the di dialogue is so surreal when there is dialogue jack nance is and is is you know this is an iconic image yeah. that uh you know it's hanging up on a wall back there and mm -hmm. you know i remember also, rush video yeah rush uh having a the painting in the background alex life's and the eraser had pin on his jacket but jack nance you know it's a kind iconic image and um he ended up being in almost all of uh david lynch's films until he passed away and uh you know, a lot has already been said. Catherine Coulson, who became the log later, years later, Catherine worked Coulson. on it with yes, him. Thank you. And there's uh, so many images in this that predate stuff that he brought back for Twin Peaks 30 years later. You know, if you look at like, um, you know, the scene of Jack Nance in the elevator and look at the floor, the floor is all like the same floor patterns as Twin Peaks, as the, as the, the Black Lodge. So he right. was already doing all those, that imagery in the art direction. Uh, the fact that it's in black and white, you know, maybe some of that stuff didn't jump out, but the fact that it's in black and white also makes it so dreamy and hypnotic as well. I think that's part of the additional appeal to it. But um, just everything from, the, you know, the, the head popping off and the, and the lady in the radiator dancing and Baby X and that one scene where Baby X gets really sick and Henry is like, oh, you are sick. You know, it's, <laughs> that cracks me up every time. And and the dinner, the, the, you know, the biggest nightmare dinner date, uh, you know, oh. where he gets to meet the girlfriend's family and they have the chicken. And this, there's so much humor in it, too. Not only are you seeing the nightmare imagery from, from Lynch that became the staple of all of his films, but the, the, the really strange sense of humor as well. It's a, it's a classic. And like I said, if it was the only film he ever made, he would be a legend just from this film alone. And unbelievably... There's three films ahead of it in my list, which shows how great his body of work is. Yep. The film is so industrial, too. Like, again, yeah. what the, the sound. sound. So the, sound so industrial. the locale, everything. Yeah. yeah. Earl when he, when he, he, he was He's heavily into industrial music, which yeah. we go actually with uh, Lost Highway. It's Trent Reznor 
and David Bowie. I mean, it's just I'm this fine. heavy, yeah. Yeah. hard, and that that I have that soundtrack, and I can listen to that. I it just it's just intense. And meanwhile, he ended up having David Bowie in Twin Peaks, and he had Trent Reznor on Twin Peaks: uh, The Return. Nine Inch Nails actually played in the Roadhouse in one episode. So obviously, See, he's I, got a he's got some. Uh, I, I didn't see the so return yet. I, I, I'm sat there. My plan is to binge it, which is 18 episodes. Uh, I didn't want to go that far into the rabbit hole because I may not come out at this point. You won't. But no, I, I know I won't. Yeah. <laughs> and then again, that might be a safe place to be. But, uh, you know, but nonetheless, no, but the, the whole thing, he's very much. Matter of fact, he had created 1990. It was available on VHS. It never came out on DVD. What he did was called the Industrial Symphony Orchestra. In which Julie he Cruz. included Julie Cruz, yeah. and I have both of her sound. I have both of her LPs or CDs, should I say? It's amazing stuff. And, yeah, I have the VHS you know, of that still. Yeah, Industrial I have, Symphony. I have it on transfer on DVD from a VHS, yeah. but it's very hard to find, and uh, it's wild stuff. I mean, he's got this whole thing about sound. It's all, but it's 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 kind of like if he had if he collaborated with Pink Floyd on Welcome to the Machine. Everything is all into this. Uh, but anyhow, that's me running my mouth. So let's go on to the next next film. So thank you. All right, Jamie. What's your pick? Oh no, Jamie. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, I'm going to do one that we already talked about. I'm going to go with Wild at Heart. I think this is the closest he ever got to a, a true comedy, though. You know, there's a lot of dark comedy in it. But when I watched it when it first came out on VHS, anyways, like late '90 or early '91, I thought it was a comedy. And we used to, uh, as 20, 21 year olds, we used to quote Nicolas Cage in this movie all the time. We go around and say, this represents my individuality and belief in personal freedom. And, uh, and he's bonkers. Him and Laura Dern are bonkers in this movie and there are two of the more normal people in the movie. <laughs> but you know what? Every, like we were saying, everything is off in a David Lynch movie. It reminds me of the house in... The Haunting, the 1963 movie. You're thinking, where are you going with this, Laszlo? <laughs> Hold on. They said in a line in that movie that they built that house, everything is a bit off, everything is a bit on an angle, and that creates this maze within the house. And that's what his movies are like. Everything is just a little bit off, a little bit of an angle, and it creates this maze of a movie. So... Um, Bobby Peru, we brought up, one of the best characters in the David Lynch movie. You know what I always wanted, though? I always wanted a uh, Bobby Peru and Frank Booth movie together. Oh, God. But I think that might be too much crazy Yeah. Uh, in one movie. Frank Booth from Blue Velvet, if the viewers don't know. Um, but uh, in, in this, in the rape scene, they, I heard that they made that up on the spot. They threw away the script and just rolled with it. And the uh, camera people and the staff were like feeling uneasy during it. But it's hilarious at the end when he's saying what he's saying. And she finally says it. He goes, not today. Can't run. Got to run. Yeah. And it's, you feel like the air go out of the room like, oh, my God. Thank God. But uh, they said that there are test screenings during the scene with uh, Henry Dean Stanton. When Hold on. Uh, my spoiler alert. Last time got blood all over it, so I had to throw it away. That's the bad news. The good news is I got this one. <laughs> that I made. Oh. <laughs> right. So, spoiler alert, when Henry Dean Stanton gets shot in the back of the head, the I story remember. goes that there is a scene after that that when they showed it at test screenings, David Lynch says of the 500 people that watched it, about 275 people just left. That's great. Now that's the scene I want to see. Put that as an extra on a Blu-ray 4K. That's what I want. And he won the Palme d'Or for this film too, which was like the biggest award at Cannes. So he, it, it actually got well received when it, when it uh, screened there. Right. And, but you know what, you, you read a lot of uh, online reviews and it's not, you know, it's almost like, I think it's like, what is it, like 62% on Rotten Tomatoes? Whatever. That, that's not. Oh, who cares? Who cares about Rotten Tomatoes? Right. Who cares? But, but it's another hilarious scene is when Laura Dern is talking about Dell, her cousin, 
you brought up. It's only three minutes long and it's on YouTube, just that part. And then do a flashback. He loves Christmas so much that they call him Jingle Dell. <laughs> and he cries in the middle of the summer because it ain't Christmas and makes like a thousand sandwiches at 3 a.m. for nobody. And, and then on top of all that, he likes to put cockroaches in his underwear so they climb up his ass. And there's a scene of him outside. I don't know if he's waiting for a bus or something, <laughs> but he's moving <laughs> with the cockroaches. And it's freaking hilarious. I mean, Chris Glover is perfect in those kind of roles. Crispin Glover, <laughs> from that point on, should have been a staple in every David Lynch film. It's, it's amazing he only did that one film because he is a natural for David Lynch. And he has one line, I think, when he's making a thousand sandwiches and his mom asks him, what are you doing in the middle of the night? I'm making my lunch. <laughs> That's hilarious. The movie's hilarious. Very cool. All right, Dan. Uh, let, me, let me comment once again on, uh, I'll comment once again on Wild at Heart. Uh, the interesting about the, some of the other, I, what, Wild at Heart's not, it, it just missed my list. And I explained earlier why it's very similar to uh, Blue Velvet. Yeah, the funny thing about, about Lynch in um, Wild at Heart is that first you have Bobby Peru, who has like the world, he has baby teeth or the least hygiene baby teeth in the world, which is creepy in its own self. Honestly, after watching all these David Lynch films, I realized, oh my God, I missed a fantasy on how hot Laura Dern is or all these films he yeah. did. You know, I didn't realize this, you know. Um, but the funny, he's, David Lynch has his obsession. Like there's, you know, he does a couple, a couple of Lynchisms. And one of the Lynchisms he does, when they're, in the, when they're in the motel court, aside from parading around his usual suspects, he's obsessed with fat, fat women dancing. And, and in, the, in the motel court, they're, they're topless. And they're like dancing in the background. Like, what motel is this? You know, it's yeah. just, but anyhow, just there's these wild things of wild at heart. It, it, no, I love it. I mean, I wish we could say, well, you're top. Honestly, there's not a David Lynch film I don't like. So when you have to narrow it down to five. I have a few I don't like. Well, yeah, I, I have a few I don't but, like. You know, but I'm saying, but you know, there, there's certain, but as a director overall, I mean, it, it, he's, he's quite a genius in what he does. Um, yes, yeah, but you know, but the thing is, is that um, it's hard to narrow it down to five because, like, Wild at Heart sat there right on the outside. I'm going okay, but there's no, nope, that's it. There's other ones I like, but anyhow, getting on to my next one, and that's going to be Lost Highway. And uh, Lost Highway, I mentioned earlier, it's 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 just this hard industrial metal metal story that goes on. And the funny thing, they've made analogies about. Um, Wild and uh, sorry, um, Lost Highway and Mulholland Drive. It's about people switching personas in in the film. And the thing about it is, in um, Lost Highway, Bill Pullman is a jazz musician who's living with his extremely hot Patricia Arquette, and he's obviously impotent, or there's nothing sexual going on, which is weird, you know. But all of a sudden, he gets arrested for her murder. He goes to jail. Uh, and I don't want to give away anything away, but then again, if nobody's watched David Lynch by this time, it's your loss, not mine. You know, it, there's no such thing as spoilers. You should know these things by now. And, you know, he sits there and he goes to prison. And he, works, he wakes up with Balthazar Getty, or the actor, or the name. Then again, Balthazar, Balthazar Getty will never starve for a paycheck or lunch because he's part of the Getty, Getty, you know, Getty fortune. Um, and all of a sudden he has this character, this highly sexual you know, with him and Patricia Arquette. And it's basically about creating like a, another world. You want to be another person as it was in Mulholland Drive. You're creating a persona of yourself within the film. Uh, Robert Blake, once again, creepy as shit, man. I mean, he is, you know, uh, this is a guy that played Beretta. He played, uh, he was a child actor. And all of a sudden he's sitting there with this kind of like very short cropped hairdo with these very clipped lines and you're going like, God, he's scary as shit. He's like Renfield without flies. And, but it just got this great thing. The, the whole, the whole, there's a whole rock and roll thing about Lost Highway. And I believe, especially with the soundtrack, but I like it because it is as I watch, and, and I'm viewing these films, I'm, I'm making these assessments. 
years later. When you first see it in the theater, you go like, okay, I love it, but why do I love it? And now that we sit here and we do this show, we have to reassess these things and we view it as, well, much more jaded elder statesman. You start looking into it and you go, wow, I understand why it's done. Um, so I can understand why his films out the gate, people come out of the theaters going like, what the fuck was that all about? They have no idea. Now, those years after seeing Eraserhead, I was tainted. So it didn't matter. Whatever he did, I was like, okay, it's cool. And, but I realized as I get older, as I watch these films and readdress them, I'm going like, wow, this is, this is intense stuff. So that's why Lost Highway's on it. It's number four. Uh, and we move on. You do one of two things, I think, when you watch a David Lynch film. You turn your brain totally on and try to understand what the hell's going on, or you just turn it all the way off and mm -hmm. go with the flow. Right. I like to turn it all the way off yeah. and just go with the flow on something. But, but his, fil his films his films are like an onion. You peel layers away. There, yeah. there's, a lot of, there's a lot of other layers in his stories, and particularly Blue Velvet, because you know people say, I hate Blue Velvet. You don't understand. This is, a, this is, this is wild as you rip it away. And as you or as you peel the onion away, you get into the essence of the film. That's his. That's his. That's his strength. Yep. I mean, he's done some great stuff, but that's his strength of making you. And that's what any artist does. When you go into a, my wife took me to a show in um, an art show at the Met, and we went there years ago. And there was an artist that did nothing. He took canvases, and he like put razor cuts in it. It was it, you, you, the average person was going to say, "What the fuck's this all about?" But you go in there, and if for some reason it stimulates your. You're going like, "Wow!" You watch it, and that's what David Lynch is. He creates something. It might not be for the masses, but all of a sudden you watch and go, "He's making a statement here," and that's that's important. Making art with his with his it's art. It's art. Making He's art. an art filmmaker. You're absolutely correct, Peter. Yeah. So that, that's it, and that's and that's what art is about. Whether it be music writing a comic, whatever you're doing, writing a book or making a film. It's about stimulating, you know, why do you, why do you think Guernica, what Pablo Picasso did the thing about the bombing in Spain? It's stimulating. And that's what art's all about. And David Lynch is really good with that. Yeah. So, he calls it the art life. Right, well, he is an art, as you said, as you said earlier. He calls he's, it the art he, life. Yeah, he started as an art, he was a painter. He didn't start as a filmmaker. He just enjoyed film, and he has a number of uh, filmmakers that he's very inspired by. But he never considered himself a filmmaker, so his his art, his films are art. And his mother would not buy him coloring books because yep. she thought he was too creative, and that was too limited for him. Make there your you own yep. from scratch. Yeah. Cool. You know, we might be we may be able, we may with our discussion here we might be able to collectively get a grant from the government to research this shit. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Right, Anyhow, right. that was my thing, which was that and Peter. Sorry, on to you. My number four from 2001. So if we were if we were had done this ranking 10 years ago, 15 years ago, this probably would have been my number one. Uh, and I thought it was wacky back then, but so complex, but in a real kind of uh, ingenious way. I still think it is, but I think I enjoy some of his other films a little bit more now. And that's uh, Mulholland Drive which in a way is very similar to Lost Highway, how you have these like parallel storylines, mm -hmm. what's real, what's not, is this a dream, is it not a dream, is that, the, is that the real character or is it that one? You know, you got Naomi Watts who plays like these two characters or is it the same, right? That's what he wants you to, to think about here. Uh, again, genius storytelling, and st storytelling, really complex, great acting. Uh, you've got one of the coolest like lesbian scenes on a on a major film ever, right? Uh, Laura Herring and, and Naomi Watts. You've got uh, Justin Thero who plays a really interesting character. He's a film director. There's a lot of really wacky things going on. And again, this is another one of those Los Angeles films, right? This movie is very L.A. Uh, it's very sophisticated, but this is not a movie for everybody. I think I remember so many people when this first came out and I was like, this is great. This is totally cool, totally different. And people are like, yeah, I don't get it. What's that movie about? I don't understand it. It's too complicated. Ah, I don't have any patience for it. You got to watch this over and over again. And I just watched this like not even a week ago. 
And after all these years and all these times that I've seen it, I'm still like, hmm, do I, I don't even know if I still fully understand this film, but that's okay because it's so much fun to watch. And that's what it's all about. It makes you think. And I would rather watch a movie like this any day of the week than these Fast and Furious car chase films that they're all the same. I've never cars, seen one of those. Exploding chases. I, I don't have any patience for that stuff. I would rather be puzzled and looking to discover little nuances in films like this over and over again, you know, for 20 years now than any of those Fast and Too Fast, Too Furious, Fast and the Furious, whatever the hell they're called. So I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Prostate alert. I'll be right back. Okay, you got it. You got it. So yes, yeah, so uh, that happened number. at a certain point. That, when I saw that, that, that's one of those movies I, I saw recently again. And I thought, yeah, it's better now that it's just a little bit older for some reason. As his movies have, have to age for some reason, sometimes. Yeah. yeah. But uh, the brunette in that movie, um, you know, when a girl gets naked in a movie, I'll sit there and think, oh, boobs, how nice. But what's her name? The actress? Her, her herring. When she got topless the first time, I literally said out loud, alone in the house, Whoa! <laughs> I was like, "What the hell? Say, say no more, please." <laughs> oh no, that, nothing else happened. <laughs> All right, with that, back to Mike. All right, wardrobe change. Hang on Here a second. Drum roll, please. <laughs> say this no more. This next shirt has nothing say to no do more with my the guy who gets naked on camera. <laughs> oh, he can't hear us. That's right. Uh, all right it's just a generic but this actually has nothing to do with my pick this is just a i was gonna say is he gonna go with fire walk with me well uh my number three um blue velvet 1986's masterpiece oh, and um i mean this this film uh I, I was already a David Lynch fan when this came out. I, uh, I knew Eraserhead. Uh, I knew El the Elephant Man, but the Elephant Man wasn't, wasn't very Lynchian. And then Dune, you know, I, I just couldn't get my, my, my mind around Dune. It was just, yeah. I, I, I... So this was his return to real David Lynch territory. This is when he took the reins back and decided, you know, he, he dabbled with Hollywood with Elephant Man and Dune. And this is when he took his career back and put out this absolute masterpiece. And, um, you know, he introduced us to Colin McLaughlin with Dune, but this is when D Colin McLaughlin officially entered the world of David Lynch and Laura Dern as well. And, um, you know, the Dennis Hopper character, what, what could be said, you know, Frank Booth is one of the most evil uh, characters in, in film history, you know, uh, the scenes with him sucking on the nitrous or, uh, the scene with him and uh, Dean Stockwell when they were, uh, you know, the candy covered clown. And um, it's this scene after scene is classic, classic, classic Lynch. And it's one of those films. And one of the things I loved about uh, Dave, about this and a lot of David Lynch's stuff, it's almost like timeless. Like, OK, you have this music that's kind of based in the 50s and it's kind of like this 50s suburban feel to it. Uh, but at the same time, it's like kind of set in modern day. So like, what's the deal? You know, it, it's, it's a little confusing. But when I saw this in 86, when it came out, I saw it in the theater and it just it blew my mind and it put, put me back on track as a David Lynch fanatic because he kind of lost me with with. Uh, well, Elephant Man, I love, but it wasn't really Lynchian. But he lost me with Doom. But when he came out with Blue Velvet, it was like this man is back and he's firing on all cylinders. There's so many classic scenes, um, you know, that it's been sampled to death. Uh, there's, you know, there's a sample of it used in uh, Queensryche Silent Lucidity. There's samples of it used with Anthrax. Uh, they had, had a song called Now It's Dark, which is all about Frank Booth. Um, uh, even, uh, you know, the, uh, what else am I thinking? There's a, what this do they just, sample in Queensryche? God, I've heard this, that song a thousand The very, times. very end of the climax, uh, you hear Isabel, Isabella Rossellini saying, help me. And that's from Blue Velvet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, uh, Mr. Bungle samples Frank Booth, uh, you know, don't you fucking look at me and don't, Paps, <laughs> Paps Blue Ribbon, nobody, you know, 
But one beer makes me want to puke. I mean, it's sampled all over so many classic albums. It's just one of those movies you can quote over and over and over. Every line from Frank Booth is classic. Here uh, to your fuck, Frank. Yeah. <laughs> Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, uh, there's that moment too where where uh, he's like, "I'll fuck anything that moves," and then he just disappears. But you see the rest of the room. That is just so disturbing. And then when they're in the car and he turns around and, he, and he's looking right in the camera, you know, he's looking at Colin McLaughlin, but he's looking right in the camera. It sends chills down your spine. And just uh, you know, just iconic scene after scene after scene. It's just Lynch. At his greatest and and very, very, um, you know, it's weird because he became Lynchian again, but somehow it also was a, a critical success and a commercial success as well. I'm not sure offhand, but I think it might have been he might have gotten nominated for director that year in 86 for this. And so he finally was getting embraced by by, um, you know, the mainstream, but he did it totally on his own terms yeah. and took his his filmmaking back with this film and. It's one of his greats. And, you know, it, by, if anybody else made this film, it would be their number one on this list. The fact that it's number three shows how great his films are. I can't imagine what your number one is. If you don't have Blue, if you don't have Blue Velvet as number one, Mike, I, can only, I can't even imagine what number one in your world is. It's just like, it's actually very exhilarating. <laughs> what is your right, number up? one? <laughs> well, that's why we're here. Yeah. That's well, why we got a like, few that aren't on my list. Oh. All right, Jamie. Jamie, what do you got? All right. Maybe it's not very Lynchian, but my number three is The Elephant Man. Now, yes, if you would have told me back in the day when it came out, hey, that dude that made a racer head, he just made a black and white movie about a really deformed man. I was like, shit, this is going to be weirder than Eraser Head. And it's not. Strong narrative. Like Eraser Head came from the weird mind of David Lynch, but this movie came from his heart surprisingly warm heart it's very bittersweet and do you know mel brooks um uh produced this and didn't want to put his name on it because people thought it would be a funny oh. story about a funny elephant guy <laughs> walking around i guess but uh eight academy award nominations including director screenplay and actor for john hurt which is really tough to to act through all that makeup and that makeup is very impressive for 1980 I mean, especially the mouth, because you would assume you'd see like a mouth behind the makeup talking, but it looks like the actual mouth is moving when he talks. And uh, but I do think there are a couple Lynchian moments in this, believe it or not. Uh, at the end, his love for the uh, old movie Freaks from what, like 1933 shows through. And there's a scene uh, at the uh, at the hospital where two ladies are fighting. And he gets up close to their face and it's very disturbing looking. They have like, I don't know if it's makeup running or something, but it's very disturbing. So you can kind of tell David Lynch directed it, um, but it is black and white and I would never want to see it in color to where I said uh, uh, Eraserhead was a pencil sketch. This movie is more of a, a, of a charcoal sketch with broader, thicker strokes maybe. I don't know. Am I getting too deep? No, that's a good way to but, put it. Uh, no. But you know, there was no Academy Award for Best Makeup, which is a shame. Hmm. Uh, it came out the next year, and people that set the, that set the pressure. That's why. They, that's why they started the makeup. And, uh, and no, Anthony Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins didn't get a supporting actor nom nomination. No, no he did not. He, he was great. Uh, in the film. They had. But, they uh, had. They had eight in nominations. London got it in '81 for the first. They film. they had eight nominations. I can't believe one was an Anthony Hopkins. That's crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. And you know what? Roger Ebert, we all love Roger Ebert. R.I.P. Who doesn't love Roger Ebert? He gave this movie two stars. Yeah. Oh, Didn't like it. Roger. What, what? I, don't I, know have, ne I have never I have never listened to critics. I know, but I love Cisco and Ebert. No, Roger Ebert was a guy that set the precedent for being a critic. Never listen yeah. to critics because generally when people hate it, I watch it. Well, that, but Dan, no one would be listening to us right now if everyone was like you. Hey, we are top notch, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you ever forget that. All right. Good On choice. to the next. All right, Dan. Am I? Up? Am I up? All right. Well, oh, let's see. Where am I at here? Well, I have to go. I'm, I'm going to follow Jamie's uh, tune on this is Elephant Man. 
Uh, it is a non-Lynchian film. But uh, I, I have to admit, when I watch it, I hate to sound like a sentimental sot, but John Hurt's performance and the joy of his character being in this world, the world he lived in, it brings a tear to my heart. It brings tears to my eyes about watching him. I am not an animal. I am a man. Oh, it's heartbreaking. This film. Uh, now, ironically, in the world, in the sense of the word, uh, the elephant man's world was not that bad. He came from an affluent family. His mother died when he was young, as was depicted in the film. Um, he put himself, because of his ailments, his, his stepmother, his father remarried, and they were well-to-do. Uh, he, in turn, went off because his stepmother didn't like him. And he did join what you want to call sideshows and freak shows to make money on his deformities. So he didn't suffer as much as in the movie, but there's a lot of things that are truisms in it. Uh, and the fact with going to sleep and finally able to dream, there were very few lynch, and it's kind of interesting about the elephant man is that he did a racer head and racer head is, is it, let's face it, it's fucking out there. And apparently the story goes, there's, there's two situations is that um, Mel Brooks wanted to do the elephant, he optioned the elephant man and he wanted a director and he somebody brought him to show him a racer head. And apparently he came out to Lynch. Lynch waited around nervously. And Lynch came out and says, you're crazy. I love you. I want you to direct my movie. And he walked away. Wow. And that's what happened. And as true as Jamie said, he did not put uh, his name on it, Mel Brooks. So they thought it'd be like Young Frankenstein or Blazing Saddles or whatever it was, not a comedy. But it's interesting, and there's you know, it, and it's just it's just well done. It's a linear story. There's a couple of lynchisms in it, as in um, very much along the eraser head uh, when he's dreaming at the end when he passes away. Not to give away spoilers, you see the outer space, and there's all this weird visuals. That's very much like eraser head. He has a couple things, but you know, kind of lynch, uh, kind of like Mel Brooks reined him in a little bit, or it may have been. Um, but it's a it's a beautiful film and it's a tour de force for John Hurt, who I've always felt is an amazing actor. As a matter of fact, when he was on the set of a racer head, the fact that they were able to grab John Gilder, who was considered at that time and to this day, one of the greatest stage actors in England. That John Hurt was actually intimidated. By working with John Gilder or Sir John Gilder. Um, the whole situation with his makeup, they were able to borrow uh, the uh, head casting of the Elephant Man to create the makeup. And as Jamie had said, the following year, there never was a special effects makeup award, the Academy Awards, until the Elephant Man, because they were able to pull it off. And when they did the makeup on John Hurt, when they did it, they did it very secretly, and they brought it on to set. And it was based on the fact will people la laugh at it or will they, they sat there with their jaws open. They had no idea how amazing it was. So it's amazing. It's, it's, not, it's not a Lynch film, but it, it is his entry into mainstream cinema. And it, uh, it did a fabulous job to this day. I still watch it. And, I, and, and trust me, when I, when I think about it, when you think about De Palma, we talked about another show we did. Uh, there's a certain De Palma era that depicts his style. And there's a certain Lynchism that depicts Le David Lynch's work. Although the Elva Man steps out of that realm, um, it has his nuances, but it is, it is his foray into the legitimate film or cinema, what he does. And like I said, it brings a tear to my eyes when I watch it. And it's a very emotional film. And yes, everybody across the world, Anthony Hopkins, Sir John Gilgood. Now, some trivia facts of it. The dwarf that rescues him from the uh, sideshow at the end, or at one point when he goes back to eventually go to visit the hospital, um, was played by Kenny Baker. And Kenny yeah. Baker is better yeah. known as R2-D2. And played R two D two in well at least in the suit in six films and the seventh film he consulted. Now the kid, who was the child, who was kind of like working with the side Joe Barker, who was played by um, what's his name Freddie Jones. 
Freddie Jones, the guy who was exploiting him, his name is Dexter Fletcher. And Dexter Fletcher, and this is like a sea of tranquility tie-in with music, uh, he was a child actor. However, during the filming of Bohemian Rhapsody, the Freddie Mercury story or Queen story, he was hired on to replace the director. And he finished directing the film. And he was, he was, he was uh, technically given the title of an executive producer because he was not a member of the DGA. But he also directed Rocket Man the biopic of yeah. John, but that's Dexter Fletcher. He plays the kid, the child in it. Uh, that's just my useless trivia I like to throw in, but uh, nonetheless, I, I like The Elephant Man, great linear story, not lynchism, but it's a great film, an emotional film, and uh, did not win, I think, any Oscars. As a matter of fact, when John Hurt went to Hollywood and was talking to somebody, because John Hurt says, you know, you and the Americans are all caught up in this Oscar thing. And some guy sat there in California and says, don't worry, you're not going to win. You're a Brit. Uh, well, <laughs> 1980 was, uh, that was a tough year. I mean, off the, I'm doing it off the top of my head. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think that was the year of Raging Bull. No, no, no there's a lot of, there's and, a lot. Ordinary <laughs> People, I think, won that year as well. But I mean, that was a, that was a tough year with no, a lot but, of strong stuff. Yeah. Raging but, Bull, another black and white movie. Yeah. So yep. Right. But it's another, and uh, yeah, but it's, it's, you know, but nonetheless, I mean, I like the film. I just recently revisited it. I had not watched it in years. And once again, hey, there was a Criterion sale in the summer. And I basically like bled the bank account to buy new films, silly old me. Uh, and I bought the Criterion. It's an amazing transfer. And it's, once again, it made this whole thing I do with the Monsters Den and we revisit these things, such as the films of Brian De Palma, this and it makes me revisit films I saw 20, 30 years ago or more. And it makes you watch them with a much more, as I like to say, with um, rose colored lenses through jaded frames. And I appreciate them much more than when they first came out. And so thank you for allowing me to do this. On to the next film. Yeah. As I've blown people's shit up enough. So go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My number three is also the Elephant Man. Uh, oh, was that was that three in a row? All three, three in a row. Three. Wow. In a row. Oh uh, yeah. This is just a really gorgeous Elephant moment. Man trifecta. It's a heartbreaking film. I mean, literally, this movie really moves me. I mean, it's just uh, you know we all know the story of Joseph Merrick, not John Merrick, right? They they changed the name for the film. Right. But uh, I think John Hurt's performance in here is like Mike said, completely heartbreaking, and there are just there's just so many parts of this movie where you're just sitting there and you just feel so bad for this character. And you're like, and you know, one of the things that I realized when watching these movies again is in, in most of David Lynch's films, he has at least one really tragic character, you know? And I was watching Twin Peaks. I'm like, man, Laura Palmer, tragic character. Joseph or John Merritt, tragic character. I mean, there's, there's so many of them in a lot of these films. And, you know, Isabella Rossellini's character in, in Blue Velvet, tragic character. And you really feel for these characters and these characters stay with you. And that's a, a great job of filmmaking to, and, and acting as well to get the audience to deeply care about what is going on and about these people in these films. But like you guys said, great makeup. I, I think it was Jamie that mentioned, you know, you're, you're watching uh, John Hurt talk um, behind all of this stuff and you really get the feeling how tough it is for him to say anything, right? And that's apparently, if you read up on, uh, you know, the Elephant Man historically, very hard to understand him when he, when he spoke. And I think he perfectly hit upon that in this, in this film. And I want to say Anthony Hopkins is spectacular in this movie as well. You, you can't have this film without him. And uh, it's just so tragic, yet so beautiful, it's expertly shot. Uh, it has to be in black and white. And uh, I think the Criterion Collection Blu-ray is amazing. Amazing, amazing collection. All of these are. I mean, I, I bought, I have almost all of them on Criterion. So yeah, so uh, thumbs up for the Elephant Man. I was actually surprised at how high I ranked it. I, I wasn't expecting that going in. But then when I rewatched it recently, I'm like, man, I just love this film. Even though it's not the typical David Lynch film, it's just still so great. So uh, that being said, the, back to Mike. The, the most heartbreaking part of that movie, the most it's 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 so heartbreaking that I shouldn't do cheesy things like this, but fuck it. 
It, You're all about it, cheesy things, Jamie. Get over it, okay? Please. Is when he gets <laughs> a gift of just hairbrushes and yeah. things like that. I mean, in, he can't believe he has something like that and so special. And then he starts to use it and he starts to feel just a little bit normal because he's brushing his hair and in come the town folk yeah. to make a mockery of him at that moment when he's at the peak of his most human feeling. Yep. Oh, yeah. awesome. How about when he, how about when he meets uh, Anthony Hopkins with the doctor's wife for the first time? Oh, a and pretty he, girl. He's brought to tears oh. by a pretty woman that's actually giving me the time of day here. I mean, yes. It's, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Those you know, nurses that's... should have gave him a boob shot here. <laughs> Come on, there you go. Well, that, well, that, well, that, 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 situa that situation, that little church he built, which was nothing more than a cardboard German diorama that you'd build, that is actually on display at the London Hospital. It's a museum. Yeah. Uh, the one he built, which is nothing, I said, you get these little models you put together, but they were cardboard. You cut them and frame them and or fold them that church that they show and they destroy that actually exists and that's actually in the in that london hospital there's a museum there dedicated to john or joseph merrick and yeah. that's so you know it's a it's it, it's it, it's very it's kind of an inspirational film because it makes you realize regardless of your defects uh regardless of your challenges you can find joy in life and you can be special, like how the whole scene with the opera, yeah. and, and everybody gets up and he's and he's like, I can't and the whole and his whole relationship with the opera star played by Anne Bancroft, that was true. Yeah. That was true. Now, on a side note, not to step away from what we're doing, there was a series that was on a few years ago on BBC called Ripper Street, and it was a TV series on BBC based on a police squad um, in the Whitechapel area in 1880s. Matter of fact, one of the main detectives in the show was, if you watch the Game of Thrones, it was, uh, what's his name? Uh, the dwarf. It was like Peter kind of Dinklage. like his running buddy. Peter Dinklage. Yeah, but it was his running buddy. It was this guy who was kind of like this rough, like kind of like guy. Anyhow, he plays one of the cops in the show. One of the episodes is based, the elephant man plays a part in it. John Merrick or Joseph Merrick. So if anybody's looking there at the Ripper Street, check it out. Uh, it's an interesting little, it's an interesting little journey. It's a fictitious thing, but it was about the elephant man because he was around that same time in yeah. Whitechapel area. Cool. All right, Mike, you're number two. All right. Well, I'm just going to quickly talk about the elephant man because it's not in my top five. That is the one that I was, I said at the top of the show that I was struggling for the number five position. It was either Wild or Hot. And Elephant Man, and I gave the edge to Wild at Heart, but the Elephant Man is right on the verge of my top five. It's got so much heart. It probably is the most heartfelt Lynch film. Maybe you could say that about the straight story as well. But uh, the Elephant Man and the straight story are both kind of Lynch at his most um, heartfelt. And it's just, it's just, uh, just a such a heartbreaking story. It reminds me a lot as well of uh, the film Mask with Cher, and and uh, not the Jim Carrey film, but the the you know, uh, the film with Cher Derek and uh, Stoltz. Uh, Derek Stoltz and who is uh, who was the the mustache guy? What's his name? Oh, What's Sam. Uh, Sam uh, Elliot. Sam Elliot. Right. 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 Sam Elliot. There you go. That was a very similar story, kind of like taking the Elephant Man and putting it in a modern day setting with a with a motorcycle gang, but just as heartbreaking. But anyway, let's move on to number two. I'm not going to change my shirt, uh, but uh, number two has already been mentioned, and it's Mulholland Drive. Uh, I think this is, uh, I'm a list maker. I think this might be one of my favorite films of the 21st century. Uh, might be number one for me. There might be a few that might become close to tying it, but this is up there with one of the greatest films of this century, as far as I'm concerned. This was, um, you know, coming off of Lost Highway, which I didn't love. And it was so, Lost Highway was so kind of confusing I was really worried that this was going to be more of the same. And I went to, to the theater, saw this opening night. And uh, I would say I, w I did not like this at all on the first viewing. I walked out of the theater and I think I even at the time we didn't have uh, social media, but I had my website and I had a thing called uh, 
the Prague blog or MP's hero of the day. I would do a post about music I was listening to or movies I was watching. And I think the night after I saw this, I posted about how Lynch just went too far up his ass for his own good. And he just, and he just went too far. I remember sitting in the theater saying, what has he done? He's, he's just gone way too far. I don't think he even knows what he's talking about, but this was the early days of the internet. And I came across an article that laid it all out. It was a blog where somebody reviewed Mulholland Drive and then laid out all the clues that were there. And it was like a light bulb went off, like boom. In fact, Jamie, you want do a spoiler alert right now. Give a get your, your thing going. Turn the light on. Go. There we go. Ding, 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 ding. All right. So I, now they have these kind of things all over the internet. I'm sure you can go on YouTube. You could probably find a million explanations of Mulholland Drive. But at the time, I read this article and suddenly it all clicked. I went back to the theater, watched it again, knowing what I read, and it made perfect sense. The spoiler alert is and this is a spoiler for everybody and you guys as well. The first two hours of the film is a dream. You watch the last 20 minutes. The last 20 minutes of Mulholland Drive is the story of what's yeah. going on with yeah. Naomi Watts. And now you go back and watch Mulholland Drive again, knowing that, knowing that what happens in those last 20 minutes is reality, but the first two hours is a dream. It is fucking genius. David Lynch, this is a masterpiece in 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 writing and part of the reason for that was maybe people don't know but the first 90 minutes of this was a tv pilot that he shot yeah. and he was and he was shopping it and once it didn't get picked up i guess he was going to continue to develop it into a whole show like twin peaks once it didn't get picked up he shot the remainder of the film to tie up everything and once you know that spoiler alert it makes perfect sense and you watch this film it's like wow every single scene every reference basically what everything that happens in the first two hours is is a dream from things that like passed in Naomi Watts head you know people she had met uh and they don't necessarily make sense in the first half of the movie like why is this person with that person and doing this and doing that it's all it's very Vanilla Sky is another film Cameron Crowe's film is another one that's kind of like that made around the same time as well uh, just as cool in its own way. But regardless, um, once I knew the pieces of the puzzle, Mulholland Drive became uh, like my favorite Lynch film. I was like, wow, this is better than Blue Velvet. It's better than Eraserhead. This is Lynch at his most genius and it still holds up. And I, every time I watch it, I see new things. The performance is unbelievable. That scene with Naomi Watts auditioning for the film is a masterclass in acting. That is a tour de force performance from Naomi Watts. And it's a very similar vibe to the scene between Laura Dern and Willem Dafoe in Wild at Heart. It's got that tension, that's, that's incredible tension that's building and building, but that scene is incredible. All the stuff um, with the scene in the diner with the, the two guys and the nightmare sequence. And then there's the whole, the whole uh, robbery or whatever it is that goes horribly wrong. And it's like one thing after the next keeps going wrong. It, it's just scene after scene after scene is perfect. It's just, it's, it's a masterpiece, an absolute masterpiece and a film that absolutely has to be seen at least a second time to appreciate all the depth of what's in there, because it's not, it's not something that clicks until you, do some reading about it, watch it, see it for the first time, then pull up a YouTube kind of analysis that explains it and then watch it again. And you will realize the absolute genius that went into making this film. You're making me want to watch it tonight when we're done here. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. You know what? See, I have never done the research and or you, I'm or looking you for watch. answers. I basically keep rewatching it and waiting for yeah. it to all the, make perfect sense. And I or love you, it. Or you, you know watch it. Or you watch it and you find your own analysis. Right. See, but I, that, I, I couldn't handle it. Like without some sort of direction, I was like, what the fuck is he doing? Lynch has just gone too far off the deep end. Like I think he does do in Inland Empire. I'm not, I, we're not going to, that's a um, spoiler alert for my list. Inland Empire is not in my top five. It's one of my least favorite Lynch films because I think he went too far up his own ass. Like without making any sense. And that's what I thought Mulholland Drive was when it was, when I was left to my own, 
like try uh, my own analysis. I couldn't get it. But once the clues were there and once it was mapped out for me, in fact, the very first version of Mulholland Drive on DVD came with a top 10 clues from David Lynch. And he said, OK, look for this. Look for that. What's the first thing you see in the movie? And and even that started to help it click. And what you kind of need to know that stuff to really appreciate the 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 puzzle that this is it's more than a film it's a puzzle, puzzle. yeah it absolutely is yeah so it's not really a, a spoiler what you said it's more like needed information that you I, I would anybody. I would listen to that for the after you see it one time because you want to see it the first time would not with, knowing you know with David Lynch there is no such thing as a spoiler because no, there it's all it's all out there for your own comprehension or your your thoughts about the film. And that's why you can sit there, you can give the ending away for a film. And somebody's going to watch a David Lynch film if they're telling the unwashed masses. They have no idea about David Lynch. They're going to watch it beginning to end. They're going to come up with their whole other ending. In their but, situation. I, but I it think doesn't. he masterfully laid this out. I think this is... Oh, no, you, yes. Absolutely. You He's could, a genius. You could say Eraserhead, Eraserhead, there is no answers. Eraserhead, you just no. got to gotta come up with your own interpretation because that's that kind of film. Hey, this, this film... Is, Seems like it's up for interpretation, but it's I, I, really not. He lays it out for you. You know, the, the, then again, you know, he was invited to the AFI to do, to come in and do a racer head, or when he went to the AFI Institute to do his films based on the grandmother, which is totally fucking out there. This is 1968. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, this is like, there has nothing been done. The closest thing that's ever been done to Lynch's work has been uh, the 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 Shen de Andalou, which is the uh, which is the Salvador Dali and um, the ants in the hand, the cunning of the you know. There's nothing been done like that since. And also, he comes in with the grandmother and then eight racer head. Nobody had touched that because everyone was caught in the mainstream Hollywood. How do we make films? Yeah, the closest so, the closest would have been like Fellini or Bergman. Yes, exactly. You know? But these were not in the Hollywood system. Right. These are people in another world, you know. And the thing is, is that all of a sudden he come and he's he's now in America. He's not making films in Europe, you know. He's making films in the United States. And all of a sudden, like, how do you know? This this is a man. David Lynch is a man that they gave him. Correct me if I'm wrong. They gave him an an Academy Award just for his his contribution to the world of cinema because they can't target it into a you know it's not like you made you're the greatest western director we have no idea what the fuck you're doing but we're going to get you're great and we're going to give you a fucking prize right. that's how it works out and you go wow how's this happen <laughs> you know and he's you know on many levels he's a genius yeah like hitchcock i mean hitchcock became a, a description like hitchcockian yeah. and you could say the same thing about lynch i mean he exactly. literally became and lynch has his yeah. own thing and, and that's why that's why it bothers me when scissor and like tarantino was so critical of him it's like i love tarantino's work but come on you love cinema how can you not love lynch i mean this guy this is a guy that maneuvered his way and got major dis distribution on his films i mean this is a guy that did doom that was a major failure now mind you he did a racer head he did Elephant Man. Then all of a sudden he's given a $50 million budget. Now, most of his films were very intimate films. He's going there pre-special effects. I know none of us have Dune on our list, but it's a campy, weird-ass film. He got the soundtrack and, on sand-colored vinyl. There you go. And <laughs> so sand-colored vinyl. And but he's sister, he does this film. He's given a $50 million, and that's why he like left. He will never talk about it. He wanted to get back to control his shit. And it amazes me in his career that after the failure of Doom, that he was able to go to Dino De Laurentiis and say, I want to do, I have this script called Blue Velvet. And I want final cut on this. And he did. He had final cut on Blue Velvet. Now, it didn't do, as Mike said, it, it wasn't successful out the gate. It had about a $6 million budget off the top of my head. It had $8 million return at the box office, but it was word of mouth. It was a late night. It kept moving and moving, and it's become this amazing film. But the thing is, is all of a sudden you've got like De Laurentiis, and he was able to cut a deal, give me final cut, you know, and it's wild 
how this worked out because after a $50 million look at, look at, at the same time when Dune came out in the same couple of year era, that's when they did Heaven's Gate with Michael Cimino. And Michael Cimino has had a, with Heaven's Gate, has had this reassessment of his films. Even Heaven's Gate. Heaven's Gate is a masterwork. But when it came out, everybody hated my hated. Him. So it, it's interesting how, you know, his, his Lynch has survived in the Hollywood system and create, created films. Now, ironically, he left the Hollywood system. When he did Inland Empire, he left Hollywood. That's it. I'm done. I'm making movies. Anymore. Same time Brian De Palma left. And David Lynch's analogy to this was everybody's into blockbuster films, franchises. They don't want directors like us. And that's, he stopped. And he, what do you, you know what he does now? He does weather reports every day. Yeah, every day. He does weather Last reports. for about a minute and six seconds. Yeah. yeah and he talks, well, you know something? I They're was even, thinking about a song yeah. from 1962. Yeah. Exactly right. It's like Grace Slick. <laughs> he goes his thing and he go like, and they're even more entertaining than whatever the fuck else is going on out there. But anyhow, I just had to throw that in because that's what we're all about here. Just throwing our ideas out, not tromping over each other. So anyhow, that's it. Thank you. Back to all Jamie. Right, back to me? Yep. Is that Jamie? All right. My number two is David Lynch's most shocking movie ever. Wow, number two. Wow, All right. I, I mean, I love that film, but wow, number two, Rocking that's amazing. That it's rated G. It's a Disney movie. It's on Disney Plus right now as we speak. Wow. And look at that poster. Yeah, a Hollywood poster. Who made this? Yeah. Made that poster. It looks like a Lifetime TV movie. Wow. <laughs> I love it. I Yes, yeah, I'm, great, gl I'm great glad film. it made the list. I'm glad it made the list. Yeah, me too. It's great. I'm Somebody glad he had to do it. But I compare this making this movie is like a, a 180. It's like Steve Vai making an album and sounding like Robert Cray. What? I don't know how he did it. Well, don't I don't you dare respect Robert, Robert Cray. Stop that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just, just well, what's the problem? No. Maybe Albert like Robert Craig. Oh, that's all right. I'm just breaking you your watch. Mind. You start watching this movie and you think this guy's an old fool. You know, ah, screw the doctor. But as it goes on, you find out this guy is wise. He's an old wise man. I mean, I don't know if these are spoilers or not, but he meets a hitchhiker. And he tells her, you know, stories. Uh, when my kids, I told my kids one day, I gave him a stick. I told them to break the stick and they could break the stick. Then I gave them a bundle of sticks and they couldn't break it. That's family. I'm like, this is Yoda shit, man. This is Yoda shit. <laughs> and he, he's talking to a bunch of uh, bicyclers uh, and they're young and they ask him, what's the worst part of being old? Remembering when you were young. Oh, Jesus, this guy. And then he's bickering. He's, he's dealing with, uh, he's bickering uh, twins who are called the Olsen twins. Wow, that's I, I don't know why, but um, and he tells him about brotherly love, and I'm sitting there going, I got a lump in my throat. And I think, though, there's a scene where he's talking to an old man in a bar about their experiences with World War II, and I think this is uh, what's his name, Alvin Strait. This is his quint moment. What's a quint moment? It's something I made up. If you watch Jaws and you remember the scene where Quint is talking and they're all drinking in the boat, he's talking about the USS Indianapolis. And he, you know, it's a famous line. Uh, I can't talk like him, but 1,100 men went into the water. 316 men came out. And sharks took the wrist. That's the kind of moment in a movie where you can use the bathroom, come back, and you did not miss anything of the plot. But what you did miss was the heart of the movie. And I think if you, I think this is his quint moment in this movie when they're talking about the World War II. And you might say, but this is the monster's den. Where's the monster in this movie? I think this movie has the biggest monster of them all. Old age. Death. It's creeping right in front of us at all. Mortality. Mortality. 
Yeah. yeah, it's scary as hell. I mean, the actor, what's his name, died a year after the movie was uh, made. Richard Richard Farnsworth. He actually he actually had cancer while he was making this film. Ah, uh, but um, and Henry Dean Stanton plays his brother at the end. Has maybe two or three lines. Is in the movie maybe three minutes. Maybe his best acting job ever. Maybe. So yeah, number two. Great choice. I mean, it's got so much heart. It's got to be Lynch's most heartfelt film, and you know, it's about mortality and death, and and life and death, and and reflection, and it's a road movie. Uh, it's so it's the least Lynchian film he's ever made. But I'm so glad that you have it on the list because it's a beautiful, beautiful film. Oh, for anyone who's never seen it, I should say it's a movie about it's, a guy well, who travels it, across a couple states on a riding lawnmower. It's yeah. it's on it it's on my honorable mention list. And the funny thing about it is in a world of lynching or non-lynching, when you say straight story, that's what it is. It's a straight story. Yeah. There's yeah. no there's no Frank Boots in the road no is that he drives on. He drives on a straight his name. And it, was, is it was based it was based on a true story, actually. Maybe this is more lynchian than we thought. Well, it, it has its feels like Sis, Sissy Spacek's character, like when they're before he hits the road, they feel like they could be characters from like Blue Velvet or something like that. Okay. Little, the, the neighbors yeah. and the trailer parts and the people that he meets on the road. Some of them are quirky, but it's just feels it's the most human film he's ever made, I think. Yeah. It, and it, I talked it, about it, a movie with Sissy, Sissy Spacek playing a troubled daughter and I didn't have to drop drop blood on my head. <laughs> <laughs> there you go but you know we, we, we'll be happy to run you over with a john deere tractor lawnmower it's okay i was thinking of doing okay. that if it was my number one. Oh, oh I, I made my wife watch this the night before we watched blue velvet she doesn't know david lynch from lynch mob with george lynch <laughs> but i i made her watch blue velvet and i was like isn't this great she was like that ain't my kind of movie after yeah. Velvet. i was like oh, boy i and then I we watched it. that the very next night and she loved it. I said, can you believe it's yeah. the same guy sent, made both movies? I, I sent you, I sent, I put that comment on your Facebook page. You said, I showed my wife Blue Velvet. She had nothing to do with it. I said, show her a razor head. She will yeah. beg you. Beg for to Blue, Blue Velvet. Blue Velvet. I would never. I think Inland Empire is even more out there than, than a razor head. I uh, think it's, it starts out linear though. Mike. It starts out linear. And then but it, it goes, through. yeah, it's at that one, uh, you know, that's that's that and Dune are two films that he made that I, I don't know if I'll ever watch again. And I love everything. I mean, you know, I I would love to, love to say I love everything. But man, those two. No. Uh, yeah. As, well, and, Dune, uh, Dune is so non David Lynch. I mean, let, let's put yeah. it in perspective with Dune. I mean, here's a guy that if we go to Dune in such in situation, Dune was the equivalent in science fiction in the 1960s. When it came out in 1965, it was the equivalent of the Lord of the Rings in science fiction. Yeah. It's this huge epic. And here it is, David Lynch goes with um, Eraserhead, which is a very personalized, took me five years to film it in a barn or whatever it was, the, the place he worked at. You go to Alpha Man, okay, we open the horizons, we're doing some sets, but it's still a personalized film. Now we throw you into a film at that time, and I correct me if I'm wrong, it's a $50 million budget. And you're thrown to this place where it's not this intimate film. It's this huge, there's no special effects. I mean, the special effects are so primitive. No, it's like flat, it's like watching flash, flash Gordon it's, or it's, something. It's called, it's called Polygon 101 with everything that goes on. And all of a sudden he's thrown, and that's why he won't talk about it because it's like out of his control. Oh, it was out of his control. I think he even wanted to take his name off of it. And he did. The well, Alan, Alan Smithy. Well, uh, that know, was on the TV yeah. print when they tried to make yeah. money off of it. It has but, its fan base. I mean, I, I, I think Kevin Smith loves it to death. But, I'm you know, just, I mean, I was, as you guys know, like it's it. obviously being remade now by Denis Villeneuve, who's, I think, one of today's greatest filmmakers. So it's in great, great hands with Villeneuve, and we'll see where he yeah. takes it. It's a it's a film it's a film and I think he did a great job also with uh, Blade Runner. Oh, Blade Runner was phenomenal. Yeah, I, every, I everything Villeneuve has made is, is phenomenal. I would love to see the I would love to see the four hour cut of that. As a matter of fact, what's his name? Jason Momoa said, you know, he wants them to release the six hour cut of Dune. Now that might be rough, but the thing is, Dune is an epic film. You can't condense it in ninety minutes or two hours. You no, can't. The story's too involved, you know. It's I saw it as a fourteen-year-old in I mean, the theater. Yeah, I, I mean, saw it in the theater too. I think I, fell, like, oh. I think I fell asleep. 
I mean, for God's sakes, for God's sakes, Lord of the Rings or Lord of the Rings with, uh, and this was like stoner reading 60s when you read this shit, you know, Lord of the Rings, when Peter Jackson made it, he had to, he had to drop, he had to cut whole characters out of that film because you could not make it. I liken it, I liken it to Kubrick's uh, Spartacus as well. When I look at the Kubrick, yes. like filmography spartacus was is the one that sticks out like a sore thumb the way that Do dune does for lynch mm -hmm. and you know but it's uh, but no but i think you know dune dune is dune is campy kind of stinky. i rewatched it for this and Great i tell Cassidy. you what and you got you got freddie francis doing cinematography you know who's major a major uh, you know hammer cinematographer and he's got a great cast. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Jay. Oh, that's all right. I probably cut you off. But um, you know, I, yeah. I rewatched it, and I said, I kept saying this movie could end now. Yeah. Go on yeah. for another two hours. I, I don't know. It I, doesn't matter. I, I don't know I, what's I, going on. I'm well versed with reading Dune in the '70s, right? Thinking it was like, oh, great, let's smoke a joint, let's read this shit, let's let's go look for the spice and avoid the sandworms. But as I watched his version of Dune, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm well versed in the story. I'm going like, what the fuck is going on? I can't wait till Pete says this is number one. I yeah. can't wait. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The only thing I, I, I want to get Pete, to Pete is Dune number, number one, one on your list, Pete. Oh, please. Ah. Just say it now, Pete. <laughs> the only thing I knew about Dune at that point when it came out was that Iron Maiden had written a song about it the year before. To uh, Tame a uh, Land. To Tame a Land on, on Peace of Mind, which was 83 three and this was 84 and that's pretty much all i knew about it and i don't know that doing it say right now I mean, we got to get to dan's pick because we're, we're running really long okay. but um uh it can't be longer than the hitchcock show relax okay when I, we're, we're, we're getting there. There. when I saw dune in the theaters back in whatever year that came out 80 84. 84 whatever year it was i hated it and like mike I, I fell asleep and i was like god this is you know, because I read the books and I was like, man, this is just so convoluted. Uh, I rewatched it again recently on Blu-ray on a 4K player, and it's a lot better than I remember it. OK, maybe visually I could see that yeah, you know, visually it's stunning. And look, yeah, anything really, Lynch does is going to be visually yeah. stunning. It's so, still plot yeah. wise. It's still pretty convoluted. And the dialogue is very the dialogue is very silted and Lynchian. David yeah. Lynch uses very simple dialogue. He doesn't really get into deep dialogue. There's a couple yeah. of moments, but overall, it's very simple. Yeah, but anyway, I Dan, can't I'm, eat, I'm number two where we are. Am my number two? You're well, number my two. number two. I'll make this quick because I know you don't want to. I know. Well, God forbid we beat Jamie's and my Hitchcock show at two hours and thirty minutes. But then again, we have Mike Portnoy, so we get a thirty-minute fucking great. Well, this is this episode is going to be our Dune. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Our Dune, exactly right. So. We're just missing Kevin McMillan. Rest in peace. Um, anyhow, what was my next thing? Oh, oh Long Holland Drive. Enough been said about it. Uh, all I will say to add to this so we can move along with this proceedings is that it did start, as, as Mike had said, as a television pilot. And they said, oh, no, no need for this. We don't want this. And the thing about Long Holland Drive, it's actually an assault on Hollywood and the fakery of Hollywood and the phoniness of Hollywood. And that's the whole thing between Naomi Watts's character is, is she the frustrated actress or is she living in this world with, uh, what's his name, Justin um, Thoreau, Thoreau. Thoreau uh, being the director and there's all the characters in it. And there's a couple of scenes where she's in these like, this kind of like hot, this party in the Hollywood Hills. It's all so phony. And she goes to the audition. I think it's David Lynch's assault, as is Blue Velvet is his assault on all Andy Hardy Americana. Mulholland Drive is his assault on Hollywood and the fakery and the phonyism of it and the shallowness of it. And it was so funny. I had a, a Butch, Butch Jones came by the bar one day and he was telling me he's a big Lynch fan. And it was so funny. I sat there and I told him, I says, you know, the situation with Mulholland Drive uh, is he sat there and he go, I sat there and said, she was dead the whole time. It's a dream. She shot her, blew her fucking brains out. She was my French. Oh, that's not, no, that's not the case. Relax. She killed herself. And that's what it was. It's basically her, she's living two lives. It's either this life of visiting your aunt's apartment in Hollywood 
and there's dreams and her, her head full of dreams and the world is her plump oyster to pluck and all this stuff. And the other side of the coin of being, a, being a, an actress that's been just been kind of like used and abused. And she has no future. And that's what it is. It's very much like Lost Highway. It's about somebody wanting to live a life that's not theirs. As in Bill Pullman, his character is sexually frustrated. He becomes Balthasar Getty and he's, excuse the term, he's sleeping with Trisha Arquette the entire film. Wild, hot sex, unbeknownst somewhat to Robert Loja. And I would not want to be on Robert Loja's bad side. No. <laughs> uh, but that's what that's what Mulholland, it's an assault. And it's amazing how he took a failed pilot and buffed it out to well. create a film. And I think it's one of his one of his more powerful films. But once again, it takes repeated viewings to watch it, to understand the layers under it. So Mulholland Drive is number two, two. two. my book. Two. My number two. Uh is a film that I think, again, over repeat, repeated viewing, for me anyway, gets even better. And I love the characters in this film. And again, there's a lot of tragedy in this story. Uh, and in the end, you're really pulling for a couple of characters, uh, most of them actually. And then you got one of the best villains of all time. It's Blue Velvet, my number two. And you know, the scene, one of the scenes that really strikes out to me is you know towards the end of the film, where they go driving up to the, to his house and there is Isabella Rosalini and she's completely nude. She's all beat up and cut and everything. And she's just calling for help. And then Kyle MacLachlan's character goes and comforts her. And, you know, he's already declared his love for, um, uh, Laura, Dern. Laura Dern's character and then she to him. And now all of a sudden she has to witness, she's like, well, what's going on here? You know, all right, that's that's the the singer, right? I know who she is because we've been sneaking in and out of her apartment and all this kind of stuff. We've been watching her for weeks uh, and to see the look of like just hurt and shock on her face. And then when they go back, they go to her house and, you know, it, it's just, you, you're feeling for these people and all they're going through. Uh, but I think one of the greatest castings ever is Dennis Hopper in this film because we know the history of Dennis Hopper we know what an unglued psycho he was in real life anyway and he, nobody else could have played that character of Frank in this film nobody and there's so many weird scenes in this film how about the, the little dwarf guy right with the funny voice and it's like and they have to have the subtitles you can I mean that's just genius stuff well that's tw that's twin peaks that's the, twin peaks the, oh, am i getting the, my films could forget i am yeah just guys. well that particular that particular role yeah that's right that's but right. the rest is on yes totally get my films confused here that's genius though by the way yeah. Uh, but yeah but this is just and, and again this is more of like a straightforward tale which i kind of like uh but it still has its little complexities and stuff but i think uh really good Really good. And it's funny when Jamie was talking about how his wife watched this and she's like, oh, this is totally not my kind of film. Uh, this would be a film that I would recommend also to someone who's new to David Lynch, because I think this is it's it's a pretty all around accessible type of movie. Yeah, it's very linear. Cool. yeah exactly. Um, but awesome. Uh, but yeah, the, the still the dwarf scene is great in Twin Peaks, but we'll get to that. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny when you I've been watching these films like nonstop for the last week and it's like you know after a while everything starts to like madness you know, mixes up in your brain yeah it's like crazy it's like all right was that scene in this film that scene so anyway back to Mike for number one as we round this up all right number one I'm gonna do a shirt change uh oh shirt change God, and I have to I have to choose go. my shirt here because I have about six different shirts for uh, my number one pick and my number one pick is something that nobody has mentioned yet. This is my Desert Island David Lynch. Twin, Twin Peaks. But now here's the thing. Peter, Pete didn't give any kind of rules. So my desert, I like, here's my thing. Desert Island David Lynch, I could only take one thing with me. It's not the Twin Peaks show. It's not the movie. It's not the return. It's the entire universe. The Twin Peaks universe. I agree. So I'm counting this. You have the first two seasons of, from the 90s. You have Fire Walk With Me from 92. And then you have the, all 18 hours of The Return from 2017. Uh, 
I am the biggest Twin Peaks fanatic you will ever meet. This is, to me, this is it. I mean, this is my world, my universe. Like, when, when, when the original show came out in, in 1990, I was already a Lynch fanatic. And I remember hearing that he was putting out this new show. I remember sitting, watching the opening night. I think it was April 1990. And, the, you know, first was the pilot. And my mind was blown and I was hooked. I went out and got a matching tattoo, the same tattoo as the log lady. And uh, I became a Twin Peaks fanatic in the 90s. And I loved it. I loved, uh, you know, there were 20, epi uh, 30 episodes between the first two seasons of which David Lynch directed about probably seven or eight. Some of the most terrifying sequences I've ever seen in my life. Some of the most terrifying sequences of Lynch's career were, it, oh, I'm holding the wrong thing. I'm sorry, you're, <laughs> I should be holding this. Some of the most terrifying sequences of Lynch's entire career were in these first two seasons. The pilot is a masterpiece, but the season finale of the second season is the scariest one hour I've ever seen. I remember watching that live on TV and I was petrified. I shit my pants. The whole last half hour all taking place in the Black Lodge with the, with the, with all with Bob, Bob, the, who's the the character, the the the, vil, the villain or the spirit or the main uh, bad guy in Twin Peaks. Anytime Bob was on the screen, I was it scared the crap out of me. So when it was finally canceled, I was heartbroken. So when he came out with Firewalk with me, I was ecstatic. I couldn't believe we were going to get some closure. Turned out we didn't get much closure at all. Well, we got some closure because it was a prequel. But we don't know anything that happened after the Black Lodge and the second season with with the original show. So, but just to have had the first two seasons and Firewalk with me, I I was happy enough that we got to explore this world to the level that we did. And I thought I would never ever hear from these characters or see them again. And then 25 years later, he announces the return. 18 hours, all 18 episodes or 18 parts, directed by David Lynch written by him and Mark Frost. I mean, this to me, these last 18 hours of Twin Peaks to return, it's some, some people call it the return, some people call it season three, but to, as far as I'm concerned, if David Lynch never directed another frame of film ever again, this is his masterwork. He went out with the ultimate swan song. And these, if you put the whole Twin Peaks universe together, to me, that is it. That is David Lynch's masterwork. I mean, you have the first two seasons, Firewalk with Me, and the missing pieces from Firewalk with Me, which is a whole other 90-minute movie. Yep. If you get mm -hmm. you get uh, the Criterion or this box set, you get it's almost like an another another 90-minute, two-hour movie of extra stuff, which also is mm -hmm. terrifying. There's one shot of Laura Palmer that just stays on her face for about a minute and a half with just the most subtle change, like her mouth is slowly starting to get e like evil. And I, I could go on, I could do an entire three hour episode about Twin Peaks alone. Um, you know, the last 18 episodes was just mind blowing. I have <laughs> all my Twin Peaks shirts. I got uh, the, the, the Roadhouse, the Bang Bang Bar, <laughs> the, the, the Black Lodge with the Owl. We got part eight from The Return with the God of Light, if you, if you haven't seen anything of The Return and you don't want to invest to all to 18 hours, just go to part eight. Part eight is up there with anything Lynch has ever done. It's, it's absolutely insane. And then we got, of course, we got uh, an Agent Cooper coffee shirt and then an Agent Cooper and Bob shirt. So th that's my wardrobe. That's a damn good cup of coffee. A damn good cup of coffee. But Everything about Twin Peaks is is I it's that's that's it. That's, in all in all your travels as a musician, have you ever visited Tweedy? I, I have not. I mean, there's lots. Of, there's a I, whole had, tour you could do there. We went out there one of the few vacations I had with my restaurant. I went out and visited friends of mine who live in Seattle, and he drove us up there, and we went to Tweed's Cafe. Yeah, and we also saw the site where they filmed the police station, the exterior. Mm -hmm. As well as the remains of the um, the uh, lumber. Company. Well, they do it. They do a whole tour where you can go to the oh, Double R huge. Diner, yeah, and yeah. you could go to Laura Palmer's house. And oh, uh, yeah, no, it's wild. But, it's wild. You know, look, and, I mean, for people out there that don't that don't want to go as deep as I have with with mm -hmm. all of all of this, 
there you could you could cherry pick the moments like the Twin Peaks pilot from the first season. Mm -hmm. Genius. Then I think it was the third episode of the first season where it was the first time you got introduced to the dwarf talking backwards and all that. It was the first time you saw Bob. That's that's epic. Then in the second season, there was the episode that re revealed Laura's killer. And one of some of the most spine tingling scenes I've ever seen with Leland Palmer, played by Ray Weiss, who's incredible. And well, then the that, season. Yeah. Yeah. Well, spoiler alert. Well, I'll put the lights on. Yeah, exactly. But the scene that reveals that, uh, the episode reveals that in the second season. And then the second season finale, which is, like I said earlier, one of the most terrifying half hours I've ever seen by anybody. You take those, you take Firewalk with me, and then you could take maybe episode, you know, part eight of The Return and maybe the it's, last it's, two episodes of The Return. It's the Odysseus. It's, it's Ulysses. It's the story. It's a, it's a journey. It's an, it's, I call it, it's, it's the an universe. Epic. It's an odyssey. It's, my, my, I'm calling my number one pick Twin Peaks, the entire universe. So I was, I go. was, I was thinking of doing that, but I, I asked Peter, I said, could I include Twin Peaks? He goes, well, they made a movie. I, all right, I'll pull back. But no, I'm a big fan of the whole. Episode. I mean, no I matter which way you slice it, he's, he, this is David Lynch. He directed all this. He wrote it all. <laughs> it's absolutely mandatory viewing for part of his filmography. And it's, it's, it's. It would be like uh, not counting, you know, Dark Side of the Moon for the Pink Floyd or, the, or Sergeant Pepper for the wall. It has got to be talked about if you're talking about the David Lynch David. universe. But appara apparently he was not as funny as that when, when he did. Once again, here it is. All the things he's done over the years. All of a sudden he's given a, it was, it was a major network. It was NBC, I believe. No, Showtime. Well, the original two were on ABC. No, the original was NBC. I'm no, really a ABC. ABC. The first, ABC. He went to first, ABC. With based on his history, also he was able to land a major network TV series. I mean, all the things he's done over the years, as weird as they may be, you do a racer head, I want you to do um Elephant Man. You do Elephant Man, we're gonna give you a 50 million dollar budget for Doom. We do from there it failed, we're gonna let you do it's amazing how he's been able to maneuver. Well, he got that. Thing. He got the deal for Twin Peaks with ABC off of the strength of Blue Velvet. That was the next thing he made right. after Blue okay. Velvet. And I'll, I'll, I'll venture to say that the first season of Twin Peaks was probably the most mainstream uh, exposure David Lynch ever got. I mean, it was those, those it, first, it, that first season was on the cover of every magazine, whether it be Newsweek, Time, TV it Guide. It was a major television event. It was a major event. And it second put only to like, Rich man, poor man, all the miniseries. No, he was, he suddenly, everybody knew who David Lynch was. Yep. And then the whole second Lynch season apart. fell apart. And then he made the film, which was a lot of people hated Firewalk with me. In fact, it was booed at Cannes. Uh, I loved it. I just, because I'm a fanatic and, you know, he could do no wrong in the Twin Peaks universe. I think Firewalk with me, by the way, is an absolute tour de force for Cheryl Lee. Her acting in that film from start to finish is some of the greatest acting I've ever seen in my life. She goes through the the, um, the spectrum of emotions that she covers as Laura Palmer in the in Firewalk with Me is unbelievable. But well, anyway, I, I, I've already gone on way too much. I like I said, I could talk for hours and hours that, about Twin Peaks. Actually, so. Wild at Heart was booed at Cannes. And no, it won the Palme d'Or at Cannes. It was booed, but it won the Palme d'Or. And David Lynch has always viewed being booed at Cannes as a badge of honor. <laughs> but he was booed for Twin Peaks. That uh, Wild yeah. at Heart was the Palme d'Or, and that was like really oh, no. big, a big deal for he, him. He's he's an enigma. That's, he's an enigma. You can't, you know. That's why they gave him an award. We have no idea what you fucking do, but we love what you do. So here's an award. We'll give it to you. But you in, in closing, if if you're watching this and you're not counting Twin Peaks and you haven't seen at least the cherry pick moments that I named, uh, named, it's mandatory. It's mandatory it, Lynch. I agree. And I'm done. <laughs> All right. There awesome. you go. And no more t-shirt changes? Damn. No, I was looking forward to another one. No, I'm done. <laughs> what do you got for number one, Jamie? My number one. All right. Well, I've been doing some silly things to introduce my number one for the last few episodes. You're going to have some props. Pictures. You know, cheap laughs. Ah. And uh, I just want you to know that I don't know if the audience is going to expect me to do some Wait a minute. Heineken, fuck that shit. That's blue ribbon. That's blue ribbon. So I don't know if everyone's going to expect me to be doing something every time, 
because I'm not going to be able to think of something. I thought you were going to hack off your you. ear. Well, maybe you'd be wrapped, I, I, wrapped in plastic. Oh, I thought you'd do a candy colored man called the Sandman. I thought you'd do a song with the, with the light. I wanted to see oh. you wrapped in plastic. Do your wow. <laughs> She's Well, dead. I thought of something wrapped tonight. in plastic. <laughs> I thought of something tonight, and I don't think you'll be let down. Go ahead. Let Give me a moment. Forward. Got a month to prepare. Let's do this. He is doing this. Ah. The candy colored clown called the Sandman. Tiptoes to my room every night. Just a sprinkle of stardust and a whisper. Ah. Go to sleep, everything is all right. I close my eyes, then I just go away into the magic night. I softly say, a silent wind. Blue Velvet! Number one! Good job. Good job. <laughs> was... I love that you even have the Dean Stockwell uh, cigarette. The... Yes. <laughs> the holder. I bought yeah. that on Amazon. <laughs> wow. Bought that on Amazon. Thank God. Well, at least you didn't hack off your ear for Blue Velvet. No. Uh, or, no. or come in with a, with a nitrous mask. <laughs> no, no, no. That was the easy way. I hope we don't get flagged for playing uh, Or Oberson. <laughs> uh, under 30 seconds, you're safe. Oh, okay. Cool. I believe. Well, for me, this is one of my favorite movies of all time. Top 15. And if you take in consideration in my top 15, you got three original Star Wars movies and, you know, Raiders Lost Ark. That's pretty good. Top 15. I think I put this up there with The Exorcist, Jaws, movie experience. I mean, the uh, it opens with uh, red, white, and blue. You see the blue sky, the white fence, the red uh, roses. And then before you know it, it's going down deep into the dirt and you see the insects all crawling all over each other. It's telling you this picture perfect town, we're going to go into the layers, the dark evil layers of this town. And there's a scene in the middle where Kyle McLaughlin's uh, dad is watering the, either the grass or his flowers and uh, his hose gets tangled up in a bush and the water will come. And all of a sudden he grabs the back of his neck and has a stroke. We learned at Penn State in my little film 101 class, the only class I ever took that I remember anything from, um, that it was a metaphor or some kind, there was some kind of film term for it, but the hose represented what was going on in the back of his neck, his veins clogging up. And then when he fell. But uh, scenes that stand out. I was going to say, I, and I love that once he, he passes out, the dog is drinking yeah. out of the, the, the in slow motion. The, yeah. Yeah. And, the, the, and the baby's walking up to him like the Godfather kid, just yeah, <laughs> but it, yeah. yeah, oblivious. But scenes, scenes that stand out for me is Isabella Rossellini uh, when she finds uh, Kyle McLaughlin in her closet and seduces him at knife point and uh, makes him get naked in front of her. And you're sitting there going, is this disturbing? Is this arousing? Or am I disturbed because I'm aroused? <laughs> and it's probably <laughs> that one. <laughs> and then shortly after, here comes Dennis Hopper as Frank Booth. And I don't know if there is a bigger entrance from any character in any movie ever. Maybe the beginning of Star Wars with Darth Vader, the first time you see Darth Vader. But he, um, he gives us this sense of danger that you don't know what he's going to do next, that you could be watching the movie in your living room, under your blanket, on the couch, and you don't feel safe when he's on screen. He comes right off the screen and in the room you're in feels dangerous. And when he's not there, you feel relieved, but you also kind of miss him. <laughs> you want him to come back. Um, and of course, the famous scene that I just... Uh, that weird ass party they go to that I would never want to go to. Get Frank a beer. 
<laughs> Can you get him no. a beer? Do you want a beer? No, I want to get the fuck out of here, man. It's almost like a scene out of like a John Waters movie. A lot of John Waters kind of characters. Yeah. yeah. All, all fat ladies sitting in chairs. Yeah. It's weird. But I think this is his Ride the Lightning. Because a lot of people say about Ride the Lightning by Metallica, it takes the elements of the thrashiness of the first record, it takes the elements of the melody that would come later, and it makes a perfect mix of both in Ride the Lightning. This takes the narrative of some of his movies, like The Elephant Man, and it takes the weirdness of Eraserhead and combines them perfectly to make it his best movie, in my opinion. And back to our buddy, Roger Ebert. God rest his soul. Gave this movie one star. One star. Gene Siskel uh, uh, defended it, though. He loved it. And they put that on the original uh, DVD release just yeah. to, to mock them, Did they? really. Yeah. Here's the snippet. Yep. Yeah. So there you go. Blue Velvet. Uh, can't yeah. argue with that. Yeah. Good job, Jamie. I'm up. You this are. beer is I'm gross. Okay. Well, is it warm? One thing I can't, one thing oh. I hate is warm <laughs> beer makes me puke. fucking puke. <laughs> there are so many great one liners out of that film. I mean, there's things that people just repeat over and over and over, you know. And to this day, I sit in my restaurant. Then again, it might be in the restaurant because I tell people, don't fucking look at me. You know, <laughs> so it doesn't matter. But anyhow, is it my turn, Peter? Yes. Oh, real quick. Black, blue, black and blue velvet to the soundtrack. There you nice. go. Oh, look at that. I have it on CD and I have it on vinyl. So my choice is, without saying, I'm, I'm going to preface this. It's obvious. My choice is Blue Velvet. But um, give you a little background. I'm a big fan of classic Hollywood. And the funny thing is I view Blue Velvet as an Andy Hardy film going off the rails. Let me explain. Back in the late 30s, early 40s, there was a series of films starring Andy, uh, starring Mickey Rooney as Andy Hardy. These wholesome family comedies where his father was a judge, they lived in small town Americana. And then all of a sudden, like, and it was very successful for about seven or eight years. And then a number of films, but all of a sudden midway through, they had an episode where Andy Hardy went to New York City to seek his fortune. And while he's there, he gets hooked up with a gold digger that takes all of his money. He can hardly pay his rent. And then he's like, he meets a guy in this rooming house he's living in. And this fellow uh, gets evicted from the housing they're living in because he can't pay the rent. He's a dancer. Cut to later in the film, Andy Hardy's sitting in the park eating his last three packages of Ritz crackers with no money. And he runs into this guy who was evicted from the building. Andy Hardy takes, uh, becomes very soft with him and says, why don't you come stay with me? give you a place, take a shower, relax, whatever it is. He goes there. And then during the course of the next day or the evening, the guy dies in his bathroom. So this is like dark shit. You go from these films that are these wholesome family comedies have kind of like life lessons to he gets thrust into New York. And it's just all this dark, crazy depression and crazy stuff. As a matter of fact, in the original in the and eventually he goes home and it's all good and everything's all it, his father gives him a lecture and it's like okay i'm glad you're home thank god so forth but in the original script the guy we brought back in to give him a place to stay again was supposed to have hung himself in the bathroom and the heads of mgm said this ain't fucking happening we're a wholesome you know it's bad enough he guy dies of a heart ailment we can't have this guy you can't have Andy hardy walking there's a pair of shoes hanging from the you know the shower curtain so basically blue velvet is an andy hardy all-american drama comedy or dramedy going off the rails and that's why i love blue velvet because it shows us even as the ant says at one point you're not going down to lincoln are you lincoln's the bad part of town no matter where we come from there's always going to be a bad part of town don't go down there. That's the crack house. That's this. That's that. Where they be at the whole town. It just it rips it rips all the sentimentality out of the Leave It to Beaver world. I mean, they even have the older aunt living with them, which Andy Hardy had in his family, which does not surprise me that David Lynch had watched the Andy Hardy films. And you sit there and you watch, and I've watched, and, and and Blue Velvet to me 
has, and I love films from the silent era all the way up to present day. And in my top 25 films, we're talking thousands of films. Blue Velvet is up there. I can't give you an actual number, but it's in the top 25 because it peels the layers off of the wholesome Americana. No matter where we live, there's always going to be that street you don't want to go down to. There's darkness, or as when I was working in the clubs in the city back in the 70s, okay, the old saying was, there was a guy who used to come to the Roxy Roller Disco. He came there, literally dressed up like Tinkerbell on roller skates. Found out he was an appellate judge downtown. That was his getaway thing. So the old saying was, in the club business in New York City, was you never know what judges wear beneath their robes, which Al Pacino brought out in that thing in Justice for All about John Forsythe's character. So we don't know what people hide. And that's what makes me wonder. That's what makes me makes me love Blue Velvet. Well, that's what the whole point of the the camera going down underneath the surface with the insects. I mean, that's exactly that sums exactly. it up. Exactly. It's just like you go in this wholesome thing. Now, I made I've watched Blue Velvet numerous times, and I want to share this with you all since you're all David fanatic fans. A David fanatic, David Lynch fans, not fanatics. Because I'm, I'm a fanatic. A, no, you're a fanatic. <laughs> and I'm, something I observed just recently, and this is being thrown out uh, to the audience out there on Monster to Death. And I'll explain this to you carefully and just follow me. Now, the opening sequence in the film, as Jamie has mentioned about certain things, he has four shots he does. And one shot he shows up, he shows its red roses against a picket fence. The next shot is the fire guy on the truck waving. Yep. Really weird, very small town Americana. The third shot is yellow, yellow tulips against the white picket fence. Now then he goes to a shot of a crossing guard, bringing kids across the street. Now we go into the whole situation with his father uh, out in the yard and the, the, the whole ideology, the whole analogy of the hose being tightened, his back of his neck, he has a stroke, he falls down, all this stuff. Now, prior to this, it shows the mother watching TV. It's all very idyllic, Americana. She's watching TV and there's this weird guy with a thing on TV with a gun. So it's dangerous coming. Father drops, the dog is drinking the water, the kid next door with his little shitty diapers running up to him, oblivious to what's going on. Kyle McLaughlin's character comes home, goes to the hospital to visit his father. On his way back, he follow, he finds the ear, picks up the ear. Now, in the original edit of the film, he's a Boy Scout. He's very much of a loner and so forth and so on. He grabs the ear, goes to visit Detective Williams at his house. Well, he brings it to the stadium, to, uh, sorry, the police station shows it to him and he kind of follows the case to the point where they're in the morgue looking at this ear on a big fucking table with the with the coroner and so he's followed this case now it cuts to he's at home he he's leaving his house to go down to detective williams's house at night that's when his aunt says you're not going down to lincoln are you he leaves. He walks down the street. Typical David Lynchism as he's walking down the street. There's a fat guy with very, very dark Ray Charles sunglasses on holding a miniature pincher. Just standing there. Makes no movement whatsoever. He walks down. All of a sudden it cuts to a shot going into the malignant ear he found with the decomposition. Then it cuts to opening the door at Detective Williams' house. He talks to Detective Williams, he leaves. He all of a sudden then meets Sandy, Laura Dern, in the darkness. She emerged from the darkness and she shares with him the story about Dorothy Valance that she heard her father talking about. And now the adventure begins. And he starts investigating the story. We go through the story as we know it, at the end of the story, not exactly a spoiler alert, but all of a sudden at the end of the mystery, he is sitting with um, Sandy in the hallway 
sucking face, it's a happy ending. Then all of a sudden, now mind you, the shot they throw at you early on, him going into this malignant ear, into the darkness, he's entering into a world he has no idea about. But all of a sudden at the end, after the shot at the ending where he's with, after the mystery's been solved, there's a shot of another ear. And we pull out of the, the ear cavity. And it's a very freshly scrubbed face. And Kyle McLaughlin's character, or Jeffrey, is asleep. And she interrupts him and says, hey, lunch is ready. And then they have the whole sequence at the end where the mothers are sitting together talking on a couch. His father, who had a major, basically a major stroke, and Detective Williams around the barbecue, and he sees a very fake looking bird on a tree. And then the bird is in their windowsill with one of the bugs that looks like it could have been in those warring insects in the beginning. And they're all sitting there smiling like it's all happy. And then it fades out. But the interesting thing about it is that David Lynch had final cut on this film. And knowing that he is a person who's very particular in what he does, the sequence at the end, this, is, this might be a stretch, but the sequence at the end, aside from where it opened up originally in the beginning was red roses. It goes into the yellow tulips goes back to the fire department, going down the street, and then it goes to the Red Roses, which was the opening sequence. And the final sequence you see is Dorothy Valens with her child in the park. And because you enter in, and according to David Lynch in interviews, when he entered into the, into the ear, he's going into territory he never dealt with, going to the dark world, going to dark territory. When he comes out, it comes out of the ear. It makes me wonder that if the whole thing in the film, is it a dream? Was he dating Sandy originally? And was this whole thing a nightmare that we wake up from? It just, it's just a thought I had. And I made this observation and I found it interesting how it kind of went into one way and reversed out the other way at the end. So just a thought, I thought I'd share that. I, the only thing I can add to that is the final shot of the bird is the opening shot of the next thing he did, which was Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks opens with the shot of a bird. The bird. But I, I personally, I, I don't, I don't think it was a dream. I think Blue Velvet is pretty straightforward narrative. It's just told in a very David Lynch surreal world. Right, which, you know, which is always up for interpretation. Yeah, which is you know, yeah. My original little... VHS. Oh wow! There you go. Look at you. I got it on Betamax. I have it on three quarter inch pneumatic. <laughs> But anyhow, I just thought I'd share that because I sat there for hours watching David Lynch. I said, I got to come out with something original here. But so I kind of thought that, and I thought the reverse was that. But, but anyhow, I thought I'd share that. Anyhow, Pete, go ahead. I'm my number on. one, ironically, is my number one. And I have never seen the original series, and I have never seen the return series. Oh. And I still love Fire Walk With Me. Wow. Okay. And I tell I'm you, right after through. this conversation tonight, I am going to rectify that and I'm going to go watch all of it. I'm going to go get all of it. You have to. Do see, the entire seeing, seeing Fire Walk With Me gives you a lot of answers that we waited years for, you know? Probably, yeah. But uh, yeah, that's, that's wow, that's shocking, yeah. but that's that's great. I'm glad you, I'm not alone. I'm not no, alone. You're not you alone. Got, you know what it is? You when I got done re-watching all these movies, and again, I saw this back when it first came out, uh, and again, but I watched it not seeing the series. Um, and I re-watched all these, and I'm sitting there, oh, how do I put this list together? How do I rank these? And I'm like, well, I'll which one did I enjoy the most in my recent viewing? Because I liked all these before a lot. And I kept coming back to this, because again, I love these characters. She's so tragic, and you're absolutely right, Mike, her performance is just off the charts great. Amazing. Well, and, I, and it's funny because she, she was in a very cool um, John Carpenter film, which is the, uh, the vampire, vampires film. And you almost wouldn't even know it's her, right? But uh, just so good. It's such a twisted story. There's all these little weird things going on that 
probably because I haven't seen the series, don't really make a hell of a lot of sense to me, but I think they're cool anyway. Uh, the whole the little dwarf thing and all the all these weird characters kind of come in and out of scenes and you got Kyle McLaughlin's character plays such a small role in here, but yet he's a major part of the show and yeah, and it's just, and the whole ending of the film is just so dark and just so tragic. And, and again, it's a, at its core, it's really a story that is so common nowadays and just, uh, you know, really dark, but uh, it's so relevant to things that we hear about in the modern age. And, and again, as weird as the whole, the whole film is and the whole storyline, at its core is, uh, you know, some really true commentary about some of the really sick things that happen every day in society within families and all that sort of thing. And this poor girl that's trying so hard to deal with life, but because of what's going on with her in a very dark place is just making her just completely go off the rails. And, and can you blame her? Right. Can you blame similar it? similar theme to Blue Velvet? I mean, where, whereas Blue yeah. Velvet, you have this ideal, picturesque, perfect, you know, place, but underneath the surface, you have this dark underbelly of insects. Mm -hmm. That's what Twin Peaks is all about. You know, yeah. Laura Palmer was the homecoming queen. She looked like she had it all, but she had these demons. She was being followed by this possession, and she was into drugs and she was into prostitution. So it's a very very similar theme. Like underneath the surface of what looks like a picture perfect story. Yeah you have yeah. this this underlying evil and that's pretty much the premise of Twin Peaks. Yeah. And the whole thing with her father was almost a case of molestation with uh, Ray Wise yeah. to the we killed her. I I was was say, before I something before crazy, we, I don't like Fire Walk with me. Really? Wow, wow. okay. You know, I like Twin Peaks the show, but I don't like that movie. On, on a side note, may I add something? Because there's a whole subworld out there called fan edits. And um, as you know, with, with Blue Velvet, for example, Blue Velvet was originally a three or plus hour cut, four hour cut. And he one of his deals with De Laurentiis, he had final cut, but he had to deliver a product that was at two hours. And that's where Blue Velvet came from. And uh, uh, I think it's on the criteria. I might be mistaken, but... Uh, they had released on the Criterion, I'm not sure, there's at least 40 or 50 minutes of outtake footage that came from Blue Velvet. And there's a guy out there by the goes with a moniker of Q2. It's only on fan edit basis. He takes all this footage and he tries to put it back into the film. And it's interesting because one of the opening scenes in Blue Velvet is Kyle McLaughlin's character in college viewing his girlfriend or viewing a couple having sex as in a voyeuristic type of thing, very much Brian De Palma as in a body double or rear window. So he's kind of a creep. And actually his girlfriend in the early sequences, before he gets contacted to go home uh, because his father had a stroke, his girlfriend is uh, Megan Mullaney who was in um, Oh God! Is the 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 wife of um, the fellow who was in Parks and Recreate Parks and Recreation, Nick, and she she was also in Will and Grace, I believe. She played kind of the boisterous comedic character. Um, but anyhow, when that was originally put into the film, it it painted Kyle McLaughlin's character as kind of like a sexual deviant, because that's there's one point in the film where. Even Laura Dern says to him, oh, you are a pervert. Are you a pervert? Now, by taking that whole segment out when he edited it, it gives him an innocence. Had he left that in, he would have been a creep. And he may not be as that sentimental to people. Speaking of going back to the uh, to fire, uh, Twin Peaks Fire Walk with me, he, this fellow Q2 did an edit where he took with some of the shooting scripts and he edited back in, what was it called, the other pieces or the other scenes? The missing pieces. The missing pieces. He took that and made it into a linear thing with. Yeah, I've seen a lot of there's a lot of them out there. I've seen that done with Boogie Nights and Goodfellas. Yeah, it's kind of wild. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're kind they're entertaining. They're nothing. They're not art, but they're entertaining, and uh, it just kind of puts a different a different spin on it. Uh, but the Blue Velvet one was kind of interesting. How it kind of you come out feeling that Kyle McLaughlin is actually a creep, not not this innocent thrown into this very dark world. But nonetheless, that was just something. It's interesting. Anybody wants to see a copy, let me know. I have that. So 
I'm interested. We'll say Eraserhead for me is not far behind my number five. I would say I, I really wanted to include this in, but I think I just enjoy, I love this, but I think I enjoy the other five just a tiny bit more. It's close. Mm -hmm. And I will say, because I've totally changed my- uh, <laughs> It looks I like totally Jar Jar almost. What's that? <laughs> ah, that maybe like that almost looks like Jar Jar. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's, he's, he's missing the pustules on his head. I will, say, I will say, I think this is better than I, way better than I thought it was back in the day. And I think if, if I was amazed at how great this Blu-ray looks on my 4K TV, uh, you know, with, with the surround sound system. I mean, yeah, it's still kind of a convoluted picture, but it's really well done, I think. And it's a beautiful film to watch, even though, you know, some of the special effects are not as good as other stuff we were seeing at that same time. I think it's still pretty impressive. I will say, I think stick, uh, st sticks, sting, is awful and that he's just his yeah. his acting is so bad but the rest of the cast is pretty well pretty good um but anyway yeah, yeah I think you got kevin you got kevin mcmillan who was a, you know kevin mcmillan who was the uh police chief in salem's lot yes yes that. yeah and if you get back if you get back to i'm sorry get back to blue velvet uh what's your name i the, gotta run <laughs> I got to run oh, too. My family's yeah, ready to have a birthday cake upstairs. <laughs> All right. Anyway, well, thanks. we had fun. Hey, guess what? I think we beat the Hitchcock show. So there we go. These are some great Lynch boxes I have, by the way. If you want to see nice. some props. Awesome. Oh, very nice. Collected all throughout the world, every different configuration, every different. But never enough Lynch. There you go. It's so thanks for watching, Antonio. everybody. And uh, thanks to Mike Portnoy for joining us today. Jamie Laszlo, Dan Brown. Uh, everybody give your comments about your favorite David Lynch uh, movies in the comments below. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. And good luck to Mike uh, coming up with live stuff coming up hopefully in the next couple months. And by maybe, the, we'll see him, maybe we'll see him here on Sea of Tranquility before that. By the way, Mike, I ordered two winery dog CDs. Excellent. Including well, the one on that the has third. the Japanese concerts, the collector's edition. Great. We're working on the third now, so hopefully that'll be out soon, too. See, that's this show. We expose each other to new and exciting things. There you go. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Right. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Take care.